Right, this is going to be another episode of Esports Salon, which I will just go to pains because I'm just a petty cunt like this to remind people. I noticed when Monty launched a show like a year ago, it was called Essential Esports. He then did all these tweets where even though I was like a guest on, I think, the second episode, he was like, the esports scene really needs a sort of a business related show that's about the industry like that. And I was just sat there like, am I a joke to you? Like, you've even been on my show, Monty. Like, I made this show years ago. Like, and believe it or not, one thing that's very weird about this show is obviously in content, it can be hit and miss. You don't know what will get the views, but it actually says something about the fact that the industry is just filled with fucking yes men that you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe how many views this series actually gets. Like, the number of them that I've had like 50 K views when they were about like obscure shit, you know, like formats of tournaments or like how, do, you know, what is it? Broadcast rights and stuff, stuff that in theory fans shouldn't be that into. So one of the things I like to do with this show is I don't just talk about whatever's going on in the industry. I like to talk about sort of like what isn't talked about in the industry. What do people not understand? Like what, how do you bridge the gap between the casual fan, even by the way, certain elements of the industry? Like I'll, I'll say straight up, when I first started the show, I knew very little about business. I didn't know much about economics. But since I don't work for .esports, I don't pretend I do. You know, I can just, just be good at my field. It's going to start like that already, Adam. Understand that. This is a minefield. I am the jester who dances around the mines. Occasionally they go off, but I've survived. Well, yeah, yeah, you can all make it. That's that's up to you. You know, we'll see how you do on the episode. So my guest for this one in the bottom left corner, I've got Adam Fitch here, who is the business uh, lead reporter, I think is the title, for Deserto. Previously worked for Esports Insider. He's also a graduate of Bronby Engineering College. I just said that because that, that's just funny. If you, It's on his LinkedIn, apparently. So oh, you've been I, doing I, your research. I just did that to be silly because obviously that means fuck all. So I, in the right-hand corner here, we've got, he still calls himself H2K Rich on Twitter, which is probably, I think, where most of the problems stem from. Because really, like, it hasn't been about H2K for a while. And unfortunately, no matter how many good takes Rich has, although I will say, he is one of those people that does make me think the world did end in 2012. And this is like a purgatory that going after <laughs> yeah. that. Because I noticed we all went through the looking glass and people who everyone thought were like whack became cool. And then all the cool people became whack. And so back in the day, I used to actually find, believe it or not, no one will be able to relate to this, I'm sure. I used to find Richard style tweeting a bit obnoxious. But <laughs> now I sort of like the vibe, believe it or not. So the problem, as I was alluding to, is sadly, everyone in League of Legends does just engage it through the lens of you were in H2K, therefore your opinion is invalid. Like, that is basically what they do to you, as far as I can tell, Rich. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I mean, I think a lo- uh, where you know a lot of the issues or problems, let's say, stem from uh, stem from where a lot of issues stem from, which is TSM, uh, ironically. And yeah, yes. apparently, apparently, me offering a player uh, an obscene amount of money or what was an obscene amount of money for the time was a horrendous crime. And you know, trying to push the guy and insist that you know, as you have signed the contract, as I've literally witnessed you sign a contract, it would be nice if you would honor that contract. That was a step too far in the eyes of the wider community uh, and in particular with TSM fans. So I guess I'm just a bad person and everything I've done since then is just irrelevant and I should just, uh, yeah, crawl off and die as suggested. Well, well, welcome to Like Minded Company then. So we're, it's kindred spirits, this group of people, right? Okay, so the topic for this one, it's actually also the obvious reason why there isn't a fourth person on the overlay for this one, because I actually personally thought not only would a lot of people not want to do this topic, but quite frankly, there's certain people who'd say yes, where it's like, I don't know if you know the implications for your career, mate, because the topic is going to be, and if people know, think of what's happened in the last month or so, nepotism slash cronyism in esports. I mean, obviously, the thing that made me initially think of this topic was the esports certification. I can't remember what the second institute or whatever the fuck the third part was. Because actually, I even noticed what was bizarre was on that Four Horsemen episode we did about it, the guy himself kept using the, like, the phrase nepotism just to mean something like when you hire people you like or something, something bizarre like that. that I didn't really understand. Like I, it was one of those like ridiculous like Montoya fucking memes. Like I do not think you know what that word means. And the joke is most people in esports don't because the amount of conflict of interests, people who legitimately no joke hire their friend, which isn't because you like them. It's just that they're your friend. That's actually the key difference. There. You should hire people you like if they're good at their job. Like that's there's no issue there whatsoever. Right? I feel like this is one of those ones where right. In the past, I could almost give a break to this topic because there were so few people in esports. It's like if you actually can just find someone vaguely legit, you're probably going to have to do business with them just to, to get anything off the ground. There wasn't a bazillion people that could all be totally separate except on this one topic where you work together. But in the modern day, I, I don't think it's unfair to say 
the industry's pretty much riddled with cronyism and nepotism. And even though it's going to sound like I'm arguing against myself on that Four Horsemen episode, like I still think simultaneously it's riddled with nepotism and cronyism, but it's also a brilliant industry to get into and you can rise very quickly and a lot of meritocracy does exist. And it's like it can be both at the same time as much as that doesn't necessarily make sense. So what I thought we'd do for this episode is, obviously, as I say, it's a bit of a minefield, right? Because we're either going to have to allude to people that other industry people could probably guess who we're talking about, or... Probably for each of us, a little select shortlist, you know, just people we don't like. Maybe we just mention their names, you know, because you have to. I think we're the right group of people who've listen. If this was going to drive us out of esports, I don't think we'd be at this point in time already. You're taking you're taking the licks already, boys. Like it's all there's been the bad times have already been. So I feel like we're somewhat bulletproof. Maybe famous last words for the episode. So right, obviously, let's start with the esports certification part because the other part about that that was ridiculous was. I mean, I, this is one of the points I tried to make to the guy, is I still don't understand why, in the end, it was just an, an exercise in optics, and that when there was a backlash, they sort of said, sorry, and then everyone said, yeah, we all quit. Because to me, if you actually believed in the premise, I mean, if you know how I do shit, like, I'll just keep doing it, no matter what people think, you know, if, it's actually, if I believe in this concept, we should do it, I would continue. So to me, the most disappointing part wasn't even the certification. As I sort of told that guy, if that was just some little small little league shit he did... Yeah, it's no big deal. It's the amount of people who co-signed it, who put their names forwards and sort of alluded in the future they would somehow be involved with the process. Because there was a lot of people on those lists who, I'll tell you right now, they decide things like who wins awards in esports. They potentially win the awards themselves. They are potentially some of the best talents, some of the best businessmen. There was a lot of people there where basically some of them were just disappointing that they were on the list. Like these are legit people I consider. Some of them were like, it might seem disappointing if you haven't been paying attention to other certain things that have happened. So let's start with this topic, because obviously we can go anywhere we want here. So Adam, where do you come in on this? Obviously, I picked you, you're a little bit fresher in the industry, but I actually thought that would be an interesting angle in itself, because obviously I'm going to have kind of a boomer perspective on some of these people, whereas I wanted to know if you come into the industry. Is this an issue? Was that an issue with that particular situation for you? Yeah, the ECI, yeah. Well, I've, I've been looking into that a lot. I haven't put out like a report or anything, but I've got messages that they sent out and stuff. So I, I'm fairly equipped for the, the topic, I think. And and look, like they, they were saying they're going to try and battle nepotism or work, like work through it and, and create a fairer system for everyone. But like, that's how the advisors were selected. They were all friends of Seb. And I don't know why Ryan, who's like his co-founder, wasn't really named in all of this. But um, he's right up there with Seb. Yeah, he right? just mentioned uh, him later, didn't he? Yeah, exactly. The, the yeah, lawyer guy. Like, those sports two players, were the, uh, well, I, yeah, fair play sports, I think his name. Yeah, something, something like that, right? So, oh no, that's very different. Def, uh, Ryan Freeman and um, is a different, a definitely different person than the lawyer. But n- nonetheless, uh, two former executives, in a sense, from esports, who just called upon all their friends and look like they didn't have a central communication hub for all of right. the advisors and stuff, right? So, what they did was Ryan and Seb would reach out separately and say, "This is what we're thinking of doing. What do you think?" Blah blah blah, and and that was that. And the, and the main crux of getting these advisors on board they're actually supposed to be like mentors so once you successfully pass the 400 uh, certificate you get put into a discord where you can in theory communicate with these people um but f- for me look like like there was like carlos on there and like trisha from FlyQuest and ben from misfits Some people who games, are yeah. at the top of their organizations which are then in some of the biggest leagues and some of the biggest titles yes. what what was stopping them from saying oh you know what we'll now have eci as like the filter and we're only going to consider these people and thus you have to pay $400 to even get considered for the role. Um, And the only reason they're doing that in theory is because they're involved in the project because they got a small bit of equity and it looks nice status wise, don't it? Like having a board member, blah, 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 advisor for blah, blah, blah on their LinkedIn and, and Twitter bios. So it's just weird to me how a selection of people who, who were brought together through, these these means that are like nepotism and cronyism well not nepotism but cronyism and then suggesting they're going to try and eradicate it It, it's like how can we trust these people and i mean like uh, from what i know i've seen like the the messages they sent out to advisors when they when they decided to uh, shut things down what was the tone of them uh quite (laughs) it was just like they said they got super leagued in terms of people pulling out they had 13 out of the 42 advisors pull out within four hours and only then did they decide they were going to shut things down and they said paused on twitter but it's actually officially closed and scrapped from what i hear they've even got rid of the website the wordpress is deleted (laughs) i I managed to uh, get a screenshot of all the advisors before that because i just want to see what's what and i want to keep on on track of uh how some of these people proceed and if they actually said anything at all beyond like the initial seemingly paid which apparently wasn't paid um like announcement tweet 
where they all retweeted and said, this is going to be fucking great, you know? So yeah, I, I think it's very ironic in that they're saying they're going to try and eliminate like the, the very thing they used to assemble these people. Uh, and then they're trying to eliminate gatekeeping by adding more gatekeeping. And I do think we do need more gatekeeping in the industry, but not in the way they were going about yes, it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. What do you think, Rich? Yeah, so I think that it comes down to two main prongs. And I find it interesting, actually, that they use like being super leaked as like a, a term, because I don't know if this is a severe lack of self-awareness or actually a refreshing amount of actual self-awareness, because it kind of was like Super League. But it doesn't just share the fact that it got shut down in a similar way to Super League did, which is basically fan and community outrage, right? Which is true. But also the inherent irony and dishonesty associated with the project right and those to me are like the two key things here first of all you have the ironic side which is you're talking about uh, you know getting rid of nepotism and gatekeeping or whatever and it could not be set up as more of a gatekeep if it wanted to right with a price point as well um which makes you know it even more stark and outrageous in my opinion but something else which wasn't touched on that much which i think is an important point to make as well is the dishonesty behind it um, it's not just that you've got a group of people who were, you know, subjectively put together and now it's like we are the arbiters of who can and can't work in the industry. You must pass our certificate. I think that was obvious to most people, but also just the the whole branding of it to me was very, very dis disingenuous. And this has happened with a couple of similar projects, which I'm not going to mention at this exact moment uh, for now, at least. But it was kind of set up to be very sort of um official like the, all the branding and all the the visual stuff was almost like some state run institute you know i really hate it when private companies use the word institute because i find it a very inherently dishonest word to begin with if you imagine that you're someone who's just recently got into esports maybe only started watching the past year or so you don't really know about many of the big players in the scene you have no context of the industry at all you're doing some googling hey is this something you get a qualification is or, or in or whatever and then you come across this if you don't do a deep a deep or decent amount of research, you might actually believe that this is some kind of more official, like uh, overarching institute, um, similar to, you know, something like a legal bar, you know, where it's like, sure, in this case, even then you wouldn't assume it's like the be all and end all, like I'm not allowed to work in the industry unless I do X. But it was branded in a very dishonest way, in my opinion, which was specifically designed to catch people in the net of this is a very official and if i get this i will be like officially qualified in an esports capacity which i really didn't like at all obviously i should preface that by saying of course that's my opinion someone could also look at it and just say i don't agree with that i think the branding was fine but to me there's precedence for that um with some of the other similar sort of things that have tried to be set up for example like the esports bar right esports bar yes. is even more <laughs> egregious because bar is actually a very specific legal term which is a state-run thing, depending on which territory you live in, in the US or in the UK or whatever, where actually it is a third party, you know, auditors essentially of how competent right. you are. And it's all, you know, as by the book as uh, in the very, uh, as pure a sense as it could possibly be. And they're setting up a private group and attaching the word bar and not even out of context, in a legal context, which to me is absolutely outrageous. And that is only designed to mislead. It is only designed to trick people. And I think it's disgusting. And to me, I wouldn't have felt felt as strongly, I guess, about the uh, the whole naming of like the Esports Institute um, if the same people hadn't been involved, i.e. Bryce sure. Blum, for example. And if this, uh, you know, quote unquote crime hadn't been committed before, which I have just sort of uh, alluded to that it actually has. Um, so, yeah, to me, I, I find the whole thing just disgusting um, and abhorrent. If you notice a trend that you'll also see, because most of these people, like part of their grounding is in like PR and trying to, do, you know, know how to put on a good face for the public. It's actually, by the way, basically what we were getting to in that episode, like networking is basically just that. It's like being able to talk to people and then not them just not immediately dismiss you. You get past the first stage, they get to know you. And then in this case... They just hire you for because affinity reasons, right? One of the things you'll notice will be a trend is they always use the fucking Mott and Bailey approach, right? Where they come out with the bold shit, but there's always a fallback position of like, but I had good intentions. Even though, as Rich just pointed out there, and as I think we did a pretty good job of alluding to on that Four Horsemen episode, some of these things have been set up intentionally. They didn't trip over a name 
those organizations that, they, especially obviously the legal case, like they can't go, well, I didn't know that. I'm not a bloody, oh, wait, I am a lawyer and this is literally illegal. Like in that scenario, you intentionally named it that way. And at the very least, as a byproduct, you hoped it would maybe make someone not quite know if it was an official body or not. That's that's just clearly baked into the pie. Like otherwise you'd go out your way not to do it. Similarly, another reason why, like, as I alluded to in terms of the industry starting, listen, if this was like 2005 and you were setting it up, it would basically be impossible to have those advisors without a lot of basically cronyism because like there were so few companies, so few credible people, people hadn't even had careers yet. But the problem for me is this, as we see it, a lot of those people were just friends or they all do business. Everyone's just, it's an incestuous mess. Whereas I'll give you an mm-hmm. example. If I was to make a thing like that, which I wouldn't, but let's say for the premise to prove that it could be done. I'll tell you the first thing I would do literally is I would go to the people who, not in terms of like actual, like being enemies in esports, but like personally are enemies of mine. So obvious example, I'll throw one out there. You might know, Carmac from ESL. I would go to people like that and try and get them on board. Because what I'd say is this, if we can establish an initial group of people, say 10, 20 people, and we're all across the industry. It's true diversity, by the way. It's like different perspectives. Even by the way, the fact that we battle each other on issues, that's going to fucking help something like this. It's going to keep it legit, isn't it? It's going to keep each other in check. Like that would be my first port of call, whereas that seemed to be almost the opposite of what this was trying to do. And one of the reasons I know I sort of only slightly alluded to it in that episode, that I also had my concerns about something like that, is if you've looked around the world for the last five years, when anytime you have a body that decides everything that can gatekeep, one of the immediate ways it begins to gatekeep is along stupid lines like politically we disagree with this person or you ha- or you did something else therefore you as like funny enough I like that esports bar thing you are now cast out of the for inner circle and like people are doing shit where it has nothing to do with like the actual job element which is what the, by the way the only premise that was supposed to serve so to me I, I think in many ways it was just a microcosm of cronyism and nepotism in esports it was basically like they put the whole thing on display and amazingly I mean, it's kind of, if people don't know on Twitter, the people who were going, like, as just a neutral observer who isn't on this, I'm disgusted by the actual, they're all the, they're all part of their cronies. They are their fucking friends. And most of them, are you ready? We're only doing that because they are cronies. By the way, if I'd set up this institute, that same guy, some other shit lawyer and some other moron journalist, they'd all be calling me out and saying, what are you doing with your group? Like, these people are so dishonest. Sadly, like I say, I've learned now, esports is politics. It's all optics. It's just how it looks. What the substance of it is, is almost irrelevant. It's can you sell the optics? If it looks good, if it feels good, then who gives a fuck if it's legit? Who gives a fuck if there's all these problems, conflicts of interest? In fact, there's another one, right? If you want to talk about the nepotism angle, the cronyism angle, we can obviously go to a, a, a great one I brought up last year. I initially only brought it up, by the way, as one of those passing comments on Twitter, like this is a bit fucked up in the industry, which was when TSM signed double lift from Team Liquid, when the president of the company, who despite what she said publicly, by the way, I have information that says she has been involved in deals, including for League of Legends players, she literally signed her boyfriend to the team and then gave him an extension on his contract. And then they all argued, like, again, Mott and B, like, it isn't a conflict of interest. Then I explained what a conflict of interest is. And like, well, even if it is, so what? Like, that can never be a reply, by the way. That can, There's no fallback of so what? Like, that doesn't exist. But I've noticed, by the way, that's why I say the optics angle is kind of the, a bit of a black pill on this topic. Because really, even if something is a conflict of interest, a lot of people don't seem to care in this industry. Like, I don't get the vibe that most, even the ones who understand what it means, a lot of them are just sort of like, yeah, whatever. Like, how else would we do it? That's kind of the vibe I'm getting from the industry. What, I mean, who wants to jump in on this? Come on. Uh, yeah, so I was going to say, like, one of the things as well, it's like it, there's an inherent amount of arrogance associated with how something like this is put together. Because as you said, um, you know, I wouldn't necessarily, like, seek out my worst enemy, but the logic stands of, like, diversity of opinion and you want people to challenge you because things grow more effectively and you usually reach better middle ground that you might not find on your own if you don't have someone to oppose your views right so your starting point whenever you're putting together something which is like uh, an institute or like certification of a uh, you know some kind of level of understanding you should be looking for opposing perspectives you should be looking for people who challenge you or will disagree with you or you think likely could disagree with you and basically keeping the whole thing really quiet not reaching out to anyone but just sliming around through your discord or your twitter dms or whatever and just talking to all the people who you already know who you already agree with like sure on a base level it's just like echo chambering but when you're talking about giving a product to the public, essentially, what you're really saying is, hey, want to hear about the opinions of me and my buddies? Like, what is this arrogance? Like, and that that 
the extrapolation of that is obviously that not only are me and my buddies the coolest people around and you should listen to us uh, wax lyrical about esports, but the, our opinions are the only things you actually need to know about esports anyway. Like, we've got it sussed. We've actually figured out esports. Like, it's solved. Don't worry. And we're going to sell it to you. Like, at no point did they ever reach out, like, publicly or otherwise, to my knowledge, with people who had any kind of discerning opinions or who weren't just involved in their own little echo chamber. And to me, that's just arrogance beyond belief that you think that you and your friends basically have solved esports and now you're going to sell it at a premium to the public by the and, way and that one... was probably like 10 percent of the backlash was the people who are legit in esports like I, well how can this exist and i didn't even know it exists you know that that was actually part of it. i think they missed just that in itself yeah go on adam i was just gonna say one of the like really ridiculous parts to me is so this is this is an exam and then some bullshit essay related thing right but there was no one involved in education on that board like that that to me is just shows how like they were not taking that shit seriously like the purpose wasn't to create the best exam possible the purpose was for them to make money right and for them to have yes. some element of control like and and that's a very easy thing to grasp and I, I saw basically no one talk about that but like there was no one in comms on that to even help them on the board, even to even help them perhaps frame things properly. But I do know they were working with a PR agency who uh, a couple of the employees were former Jens Hilda employees. Um, and even then, like miscommunication was a, a huge part of it. So like they, they weren't even telling <coughs> what what exactly uh, the shape the, the product was taking to some of the advisors. I can't speak for all of them. I haven't spoke to all 42. Um but you know what I mean? Like, like, even then, it's not even a proper echo chamber because they're not sharing what the fuck they're thinking about and what they're going to do. And then they didn't even have people who would bring any actual value, in my opinion, um, on like an exam uh, involved in such echo chamber. So like, it was just ridiculous to me, like no communication as to who put together the exam. Did the advisors all help on that? Like it was it was um, literally a shit show from from beginning to end, of course, which was only what, like between 24 and 48 hours. I think Hopefully. we I think we knew what or I believe this is my belief at least as to what the real goal of this was. Um and I think as I said, I, I think there's precedence for this with people like Bryce who have already tried to gatekeep other areas of the industry anyway. But for the other people, um many of which uh I mean so for example, you know, Thorin, you said you looked at some of the names and you were disappointed. You think some of those people are legit. Me personally, it was two groups. It was people I didn't know enough about really to judge, and the other ones I wasn't remotely surprised to see. And the sort of connection I've made there in my head, at least, is that this is actually more about um, shortcuts shortcuts in their own career. And what I mean by that is, again, for the, the uninitiated in esports, if I'm talking to a player or whoever, like let's say I'm an org owner or let's say I work for ESL and I'm trying to get keep teams to sign up for events, whatever it is, I can just point to this thing, which, again, has been very deliberately branded to look super official and almost like this state run, state approved nonsense and say, you can trust me. I'm part of this panel. And I think on an individual level, that was actually the primary motivating factor. Whether or not these people were paid ahead of time, blah, 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 whatever. Actually, honestly, that never really factored into my reasoning other than it being sort of uh, a nasty taste in the water, the fact that obviously they're gatekeeping at a price point as well, which is even worse. But I think more so it was about pulling the wall further over people's eyes or at least giving themselves a leg up when it comes to negotiating with TOs, with players, um, in whichever field they are, even on the journalistic level, that, wait, what do you mean you don't want to talk to me? Trust me, I'm legit. Look, I'm a part of this. Um, and to me, that was, the, I, I believe at least, that was the primary motivating reason why these people signed up. Right, one of the ways I thought we could do this, because obviously we can go a million angles, is maybe we each, like, when we're making a point, we pick an anecdote. Again, you don't have to name the person if you want. If you want to name a person, that's up to you. It's your head. Like, basically, that's how I'm going to do it. So I thought, like, over the years, there's been many, many cases, and it kind of, like, it gives you all the examples of the relationships, and I hopefully it'll show fans at the end, like... As I say, the term riddled wasn't used for hyperbole. So an, an obvious one I actually just thought of immediately there, because Adam mentioned the dreaded Voldemort level name, which is if you are someone who is just a casual fan of the game or you only exist outside of the industry, you're going to hear the name Jens Hilgers and you go, oh, who's that like? Now, if I say, oh, he's a founder of G2 and, you know, he helped co-found the uh, Esports Observer, you're going to think, okay, that all sounds fine so far. No, but here's the problem, right? He actually was the, like doing both of those at the same time for a number of years, like at least one or two years. So as a result, think about that, right? Someone founded what, by the way, I'll absolutely say right now is at the moment, the gold standard of 
Esports reporting in terms of business, like in terms of like the number of quality people they've had. They've obviously brought in a lot of outside people. On certain stories, they've done a very good job as far as I can tell. I will say you have to like sign up and there's these weird aspects to it, but whatever, it's by the by. But the problem was they had a direct conflict of interest immediately where essentially someone set up a site to report about esports business. He himself has been involved with G2, this site and DSL and others. And essentially you can imagine... I won't say they would, but they might tiptoe around those topics if it was him. And it wasn't until, and this is going to be another trend you'll notice, Richard Lewis just outed the fact that, like, this is actually, like, irresponsible journalism. You are required to disclaim and disclose the fact that you have this connection to this individual, especially if you ever report on his team Mm -hmm. or, say, his rival teams, for example. Now, eventually, they did what they all do in esports, which is you either, like, put up a page like HLTV has where you can link to it, but, like, no one fucking clicks that because it's not even a link on the site or what you do is you just like one time mention it and then you go well I'm sure my fans will remember that like seven years later because like basically there's always a way around it so like that's an example to me of where that again because people wanted there to be a site that would cover esports like there was no for all it was in fact one of those examples where most people sort of thought aren't you being a bit petty there aren't you nitpicking like whereas to me that's a big deal because think about it logically in the modern day it wasn't even as sinister back then but in the last few years the entire game of esports is about vc and if i hear i'm getting into esports right i think i'll go oh my god there's a site that's just business sick this is sort of like sports business journal which is obviously by the way what they fucking modeled their entire fucking brand off and they're so when you go, by the same company now and the same people yeah. basically now work for it yeah and then when they go there right logically you're gonna go now i'm getting the inside look on it and then guess what? You might then decide to invest in a team. I don't know, G2 maybe. Or if it was an auto tournament organiser, maybe ESL would be who you'd buy. Like, you can see the obvious way that the good intentions part that they're going to handle, the, the great part of it, it can basically be seen cynically as just, uh, that's just the marketing and behind the scenes, there was always an ulterior motive. I always say this, right? In life in general, it's very useful for politics, this. People don't make mistakes that make them rich and more powerful. When you make a mistake, it fucks your life up. When you accidentally trip over and get a load of money or you get a better job, like that was basically you're, you're, you saying you tripped up is what the fucking, that's just the excuse. You didn't, you did it on purpose, but it's a great get out to just say, oh, I'm a bumbling idiot and oh, I just happened to fucking do exactly what me and my mates needed. So like, there's an obvious one to me. I know the reason I bring that one up is because apparently they say they've divested. Again, it's yes. just in an article. I don't actually know technically, but I could believe they have. Yeah. But obviously... As I say, it's, it's something that did happen in the industry and they certainly didn't go out of their way to disclose it. No. Well, I can add a bit more to that. Um, yeah, go on. So, so with Bitcraft, obviously, ends is like a VC fund. Um, also, StoryMob is part of that, which is like probably the, the biggest PR agency in esports right now. Um, and the and Seb Park also- guy is, funnily enough. <laughs> well, uh, there you go. <laughs> Would you believe that? And, and also, even though they divested, if you look at the addresses in which both Bitcraft, well, like Jens's Bayes Esports Data Project and Observer, they're in the same building still. So <laughs> I imagine Jens could just go down a couple of floors and have a little word with... Let, let's not forget, you know. by the way, about Jens Hilber investing in Fnatic, uh, ladies That's and gentlemen. Well, was, was it a loan or something he, he gave them? And yeah, a loan. The Fnatic gear? Yeah, Famously, have- the meme became... Because this is how Riot is, that they reversed the loan, right? Which I love because I made a point in my video. Like, I've added like a whole 20 minutes on that, mate. Like, basically, what happened was Fnatic, I know fans aren't going to believe this, about five years ago, four years ago, Fnatic was in some sort of financial trouble. Fancy that, Rich. Imagine if that was an ongoing (laughs) theme. Do not. But it wasn't, of course, it wasn't believed by fans because they're sick at League of Legends and CSGO. So, you know, that connects somehow in a way I don't understand. And basically, the story is because this guy, who you can imagine if he's starting all these companies, he's got his own, like, investment group basically he has money to throw around and he likes to get all his fingers in the pies as a lot of these people do so basically he offered to essentially support what is his direct rival in most of the games with a loan that came with this mad clause that effectively said if you if you sort of default on the loan I own Fnatic at the same time that I own G2. Now, what's great about this is it's one of the rare times, Rich, that because another company obsessed with optics is Riot Games, the only way you can actually get Riot Games to do the right thing is you have to shame them publicly. If they feel shamed publicly because they virtue signal, they have to, to some degree, address it usually. So what happened was when we all pointed out well, you guys even say you can't have ownership in two teams. like Because famously, the way they claimed that they had to get rid of Monty from Renegades is they claimed to know that he planned 
planned to sell part of the company back to the Badawi guy later on or make him like the president in some way like over the all. So basically, they claimed that if it was going to happen in the future, they treated it as if it happened now. And in this particular case, that technically meant that he already was the owner of two LCS teams. So just on those grounds alone, they had to make them reverse the loan, which to me just sounds like... All right, I was about to rob this bank, but you know what? What if I put the guns down, take the mask off, and we all just walk out of here and say nothing happened? Like, that's kind of what they did in that scenario. So there's another classic one with the Jens Hilger related one. Uh, I, I can add a bit more to the whole yeah, go on. thing, just just so um, the people watching get a, a bit of a fuller grasp of like how deep this runs. And obviously, it goes much further than what we're just discussing here. But like, so Bitcraft is his fund, but I'm, I'm 99% sure Axiomatic is like the biggest contributor to that. And Axiomatic is a company that has invested in Team Liquid. And I believe uh, the Golden State Warriors are involved in Axiomatic. And then yes. obviously they operate Golden Guardians. So yeah. then they've got Team Liquid and Golden Guardians. And I think they invest in Epic Games, which obviously operates Fortnite. Reasonable. And Team Liquid, uh, Team Liquid and, are involved and... in Fortnite. So I mean, like, there, there's a lot more. You can go on like Bitcraft's uh, website and see literally all, like, it's probably like 15, 20 um, esports related companies they're invested in right now. All, like almost cornered the market on like every single market out there, you know. But yeah, even even goes back to like Team Liquid and Golden Guardians if you if you want to look into it far enough. By the way, I actually also did a video on that one. I know it sounds crazy, Sweet. doesn't it, Adam? It's almost like I don't already do tweets. Every now and then I do dip my foot <laughs> in the pool and do a little bit of this thing called journalism, you know. But no one no one seems to notice it because as actually one of the main editors of ESPN told me to my face, you're really more of a content creator, he said, as he then just set fucking, I don't know, Jacob Wolf to do a Call of Duty story or something, you know. Like, it's always nice to hear from the, the newer people in the industry. By the way, that particular individual was just a staff writer when I was on Gamers, but that's just the way the industry works, isn't it? But anyway... I'll just point out again the way Riot deals with conflict of interest and basically like ridiculous scenarios like this. So on the case you're talking about, I believe there was even a third team that off the top of my head, I can't remember, might even have been Cloud9 or something. And basically it was like technically, as you say, like two people from Golden State Warriors, they were involved, one directly with Golden, with Golden Guardians, then one through this investment group in Team Liquid. And then there was a third one, I think it might have been Cloud9, someone like that they were also mm -hmm. involved with. So there was this mad incestuous three-way. When Riot found out about that, this is even more mad in the context of what I said before about not having multiple ownerships. They didn't even say reverse the loan or bad news, you're fired from the league, Monte Cristo. What they said was, and this is mental, we're going to give you one year to divest. And this was the first year of franchising, by the way. So franchising <laughs> was going on. And they were like, you know what? For the first year, you could all potentially just cheat and rig everything you want. But you know what? After that, they'd be really rude and remiss of us if we didn't, like, you know, really make you down. And that, by the way, just in case you want to know how esports works, if people like us who are just bloodhounds don't just 24-7 hound this and become like a quest. By the way, I've never seen any report on whether they actually did divest. No one knows. As far as I know, it was never never followed up on. It's not really the sort of thing Riot would do. Again, you have to you have to force them into these things. So I think they, these are all pretty good examples because if you notice, we've gone the whole spectrum here. We started with like a, in theory like an extra third party body that would uh, you know officiate things, and we've gone into like team owners being involved with journalism, basically. Then we've gone into investors being in multiple teams at the same like it, go, it never stops i mean if you want to keep it going with that the angle of like jens hilgel's affiliated because if people haven't noticed he is some sort of doctor evil type character <laughs> yes. in spots yes. as well, but it's not really as cool one of the angles with him was i'll i'll find this right and i'll put it in the description when i find it but so you might remember this rich when they launched weezer which was mainly about cs go it was essentially by the way a response to what in america they were going to do where they were going to have pea which was sort of like flashpoint 0 0.5 where it was yeah. going to be like a franchise league but it would be all american orgs and then in europe esl's move was like right we're going to do this thing called weezer which we're going to pretend is like yes an affinity group of teams but we also can provide arbitration for teams and players that aren't in weezer which by the way just even the idea, I almost yeah. like, I almost appreciate the gall of these people, you know, when they say things like that, because it's just so mad. And basically, there was an infamous graphic someone made that was like, you know, the it was like the hidden hand. I've got it. And it yeah, you link me it, because I'll obviously, I'll, I'll put it in the description later. And basically, what it shows is that like, Ralph Reichart has like shares in SK, which he sells to the guy from ES Force, who simultaneously owns like essentially the better part of three different teams, including two CIS teams. And then he's in Wisa, which goes over to like another thing, which has, yeah, Tilgers about like me the tentacles are ridiculous on this like when i say incestuous like if this was your family tree you should probably all be in prison immediately like you have just violated many state laws in america i'm almost certain i think a good <laughs> point of comparison for, for sort of uh maybe older school people who have been following or just like to sort of cross-reference is yen Tilgers kind of like 
baby Alex Garfield, if people remember yes. Alex Garfield from like EG and many other teams. And essentially what he tried to do, which I think, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if people tried to do now even, but, uh, you know, even back then Alex didn't fully get away with it. It's basically own a stake or at least influence in a whole bunch of different teams and then try and use that to collective bargain against like TOs and the like. Yes. And uh, yeah, and, and what's sort of more outrageous now is obviously that's going back, you know, five, six years ago now at least. Um, yes. And you would think with the growth and power of uh, organizers like Riot Games and, you know, even to some extent ESL, that these things would be like nipped in the bud, but this kind of stuff still goes on all the time. Um, just a small anecdote, and I understand that this is very like uh, frying very small fish compared to what we've just been no, talking about. But I just want—I just basically want to out him because he's a little weasel, and I didn't feel like he's got enough uh, oh, traction boy. at the time. Is um, people might know that um, cringe lord uh, Darius, who now works as the like head of content or whatever at Shout, big fan of mine apparently. Yeah, great, great guy. He's like the, he's a stunt in the literal sense, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, great guy, very intelligent. Uh, yeah, I had a debate with this guy um oh, about oh a year ago or so maybe a little bit more it was just before he joined Schalke um and it was uh, the debate was under the guise that he was actually still an independent journalist and essentially that was going to be his angle that he was like investigating or like exploring the arguments and he felt a certain way and he knew I felt an opposite way so we were what was the premise it. of the debate the, so the premise of the debate was um the financial viability of esports teams uh in the LEC and right. mo moving forward and obviously most people kind of know my uh, overarching viewpoints on that sure. um and obviously we got more sort of into the nitty gritty and he was like as stark as it could possibly be. And people might think that I'm like, you know, fairly polarizing with some of my people. This guy was like off the scale, like defending and vitriolic about why it was going to work. And even during the debate, I was kind of like, why is this guy like so emotionally invested? Like, this is pretty nutty. Like this guy has no skin in the game. Like, what is this even worth? And then just after the call, this wasn't even like I found out, by the way, this is how unbelievably brain dead this individual is. He messaged me, as soon as the debate was over, and he said to me, oh, by the way, I'm working for Schalke next split. And I was like, what? Like, wh what is this? And then not only that, but we, when we agreed to, or when I agreed to do the debate with him, it was under the premise that this debate was going to be recorded and then put on the Shot Caller channel. The Shot Caller immediately shut down, basically the day of the debate. He didn't even record the debate, but because I didn't trust this guy in the first place, I had actually recorded it myself and then I uploaded it. But on the basis of how the debate had gone, he really didn't want to upload it to my channel or any other channel and he tried to stop me from doing so. Uh, and I even posted the screenshot sort of categorically, uh, you know, showing that this is exactly what happened on Twitter. So it's on Twitter and you can see uh, how it went down on Twitter. But yes, the TLDR is essentially someone who was secretly working for an esports org, felt it was reasonable to have an impartial debate with me about the viability of esports orgs in the LEC, which is absolutely outrageous. And, and now they're probably going to sell their front now, well, yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Get fucked is all I can say to that. But um, also to sort of touch on, on uh, something similar, um, <coughs> I think something that's really important to, to point out that people forget about um, along the sort of the lines of like the conflict of interest and the twisting by Riot and how they deal with certain orgs differently and all the rest of it, is um, people forget that Bryce Blom was the guy that actually negotiated with Riot on behalf of the teams when it came to franchising, right? This guy who obviously we've been talking about before when it comes to the Esports Certificate Institute and the Esports Bar, these essentially gatekeeping organizations, uh, who, you know, is first and uh, foremost, you know, has been quote unquote, helping players, having them do contracts, whatever. I'm not going to talk about his credibility as a, a lawyer when it comes to like specifically doing legal work. I don't believe that he's particularly bad based on, you know, things that I've heard about this guy did this, this contract for me or whatever. But one of the biggest conflicts of interest in esports in general is the fact that this guy is prancing around trying to set up all these organizations saying, hey, if you want to be qualified in esports, do this. Hey, if you want to be considered like a real esports lawyer, you need to be part of the esports bar, etc." was actually the guy who negotiated on behalf of the teams with Riot. And that's super important to understand because this is someone who has been speaking on players' behalf without their, you know, without them asking really about, you know, what's important and how we need to change the industry and all the rest of it. And in my opinion, this guy is already inherently conflicted out being a part of any of these style of conversations. And I do actually think this is something I feel pretty strongly about. And I really dislike when I see people like 
Bryce and people like Ryan trying to take the sort of moral high ground about like policing the the industry basically and talking about rights of players and all this kind of stuff when you inherently voted against player rights when you negotiated on behalf of the teams and in my opinion that's that's not an opinion if you if you barter on behalf of esports orgs with Riot about the terms under which you can sign players, under what should fall in legislation and should you take anything to the local jurisdictions when it comes to visas, all the rest of it. You're doing that while representing the orgs who are going to be negotiating against players. And in my opinion, once you've done that and that league still exists, you can no longer be, at least in a professional capacity, uh, a quote unquote advocate for player rights in the industry when it comes to, you know, contracts, let's say, with esports organizations. Mm-hmm. And it's a point I haven't really heard anyone make publicly, but I think it's super important. And it's kind of like, I guess, a PSA in terms of, you know, how I feel that players should balance their priorities when speaking to sort of different experts in, in the field. I think it's a very important context. Right. Actually, I've got a couple of points. I'll address actually the first one because I actually have a little addendum to the Darius X Machina story, which, by the way, like, again, actually, Rich said it's a petty story there because this isn't like a massive figure. Like the other people we're talking about, these are like world shakers that have done enormous things in esports and will in the future. This is just someone basically who's just gone out of his way to piss me and Rich off. And guess what? This is what you get when you do it. So I remember also someone pointed this out to me. I had a look into it. When that whole Neon thing was going on, which particularly was blown up in LEC's face, even though actually in CSGO, the way Blast handled it was probably a lot yes. worse and they actually had worse intentions. It's just the difference is Blast to the, aren't really Riot in the same way where Riot have just gone out of the way with the game to imply they're morally better than you. Therefore, you know, it's kind of egg on their face if you can show they're not. Right? When the whole Neon thing was going on, because not only was it like a ridiculous angle of that you'd be sponsored by that company, but it also tied into the whole thing of like certain human rights concerns people have or how do people treat it based on their demographic status, etc. It's the most polite way to say it. This guy, the same guy, decided to do exactly what all the grifters in esports do, which is like, oh, is there a really serious cause here that actually affects people's lives and, you know, whether they get killed or not? Let me see if I can get someone I don't like fired that's had nothing to do with it. So what he did was he tried to pivot and imply that Paris Saint-Germain, the football club, which obviously have like a Dota 2 team, they have a League of Legends team, that in light of this, how could we possibly allow them to sort of be sponsored? Because I believe technically they were like sponsored by the state of Qatar, right? And he, he was sort of implying well if you guys are against this what about PSG like how can we let them do it of course he at the time worked for Schalke who essentially as the football club again I don't claim this is what I heard it seems to check out when you do a brief search is sponsored by Gazprom a Russian uh, like energy company which itself has connections to the Russian state slash government and if you look into the Russian state's topic uh, sort of like torn and policing of that exact issue which was the hot button issue between Neom and between the Qatar issue basically similarly or a tangential to that and even if someone says as he did because they're all weasels they can they never just say they're wrong by the way and take an L they can never take an L my joke is they take two L's at the same time flip them sideways and think it's a W There's the <laughs> not a bad line listen I'm good I, I come up with some good ones now and then basically what he tried to do was go well that's not technically Schalke the esports team first of all that literally applies to PSG then he tied the angle of like but are they entirely with the you know the government because by the way in the same way as we all when we play League of Legends pretend that a CCP member being tangentially related to like Tencent doesn't mean that they're related to the government essentially all you've done there mate is you put one level of abstraction in the way it might as well be the same thing right so that was just a pretty good one because I even thought on that one you notice by the way the trend it ties back into what you're saying about the people who are disappointed in the esports lawyer side the trend is this and here's something I want people who are newer fans to pay attention to because it will repeat constantly that's weird. Why would the people who want to be the police be the ones who want to commit all the crimes? Exactly! I don't know if you know this, guys, but that's why they want to be the police. That's why they want to kick out, by the way. The first people on their list aren't like, what about these people who are, like, you know, credibly accused of rape? Or what about these people who have, you know, stolen that? No, the first people they need to kick out of the industry is Richard Lewis, Thor. Like, <laughs> the people, by the way, who actually do call this show. I thought, it's not that, funny how that works. And then the tangential one is, I'll go back onto the lawyer angle. Because the lawyer angle, since basically a lot of lawyers Lawyers work as agents in esports. This is becoming a big deal now in CSGO because it wasn't a big deal before. People used to just negotiate themselves. Essentially, I'll, I'll call one of them out, Ryan Morrison. What I heard behind the scenes repeatedly was that basically his organization would represent players and the teams that the fucking players played for. And they are you ready? Same little mechanism, guys. 
but it's a different guy in our office who does yeah. the thing. He, you all work for the same people. And so as a result, I, I'm just going to say this. You can imagine which side, because remember, right, what you're saying there essentially is, here's the obvious version. So the company that pays me $10,000 that I represent is going to be negotiating against the guy who pays me $1,000. I wonder how I'll handle this negotiation. I mean, listen, I'm sure everyone can see which way your bread's buttered on that one. Uh, so I have a really good uh, example, actually, of, of the side of this, um, which is Ryan Ryan Morrison's company uh, represented two League of Legends players. And for anyone who doesn't know, I represent League of Legends players in Europe. I have like a hard and fast rule for myself, which I'm not trying to impose on anyone specifically, but I do think there should be in my opinion that it should be regulated and I, I do think there should be certain guidelines I don't know what those would be specifically but my hard and fast rule is I will never represent multiple players who play the same uh, position that are in similar spots in their career so for example I might represent a top laner who for example I represent Oddo right I'm never going to represent like Alfari at the same time because they're similar caliber players who are going to be competing for the same kind of contracts but I might consider representing a player who's like a brand new on a rookie deal or in ERLs or something right but even then I will speak to the player about that and ask if they're comfortable with it because they might have the ego of Saturn and think that they're better than the other guy I'm representing, right? Just to make so, it explicit, like the logic you didn't like the sort of verbalize there is the problem is, let's say you represent Odo Amne and Alfari. Well, there might yeah. be a team that's deciding between Odo Amne right. and Alfari. And effectively, it's the same scenario I said earlier. You're just, essentially, you can decide which one of them gets the gig, yes, right? Exactly. And there are agents who do represent players who are competing for the similar levels of contracts. And I really dislike that. And one thing I do actually like which has been suggested and I hope goes through is that the agent's name will be put on the right database, which I actually think would be really good to me. Well, there's no down, there's yeah. no downside to that whatsoever. Cool. And it's really good because as a player, you're like, hang on, this guy represents like four top laners. Like I'm going to be so low down the priority list, right? But Xerxy, for example, a jungler I'm sure most people are aware of, this guy literally got forced out of Europe because his com uh, Ryan Morrison's company represented the guy that took his job. That was his like his job, basically. Take it if you want to take it. Oh no, never mind. Uh, someone else from his company is representing this guy who's competing for it. See you later. Go to NA. That was essentially the nuts and bolts of what happened. I'm sure you know because he's a a nice guy who doesn't want to ruffle feathers. If you ask him directly, he'll say like, oh, "I was considering going to North America anyway." Oh, I was a bit of <laughs> but in reality, that's that's what happened, right? And this is the problem of these people who are like trying to monopolize the industry. And like, to be honest, the way I think about like esports lawyers is kind of like if someone's choking in a restaurant, right? And someone's like, is anybody a doctor? And the guy comes up and performs the Heimlich, right? That doesn't mean that this guy who performed the procedure was the perfect candidate to do this. If you could handpick someone you wanted to do this on your behalf, then you'd probably pick someone else. He's just the closest thing there is near you right. to what is quote unquote a doctor. And that's the problem or like the fallacy I would say with like the quote unquote esports lawyer is that people, again, especially the uninitiated who haven't been around the scene for that long, assume like, oh, but this guy's a lawyer who specializes in esports. It's like, no, this is an, a lawyer who graduated from some absolute dog shit school and didn't get particularly good opportunities anywhere else, never had a, a shred of a chance of making partner in any reputable firm. But, oh, look, esports is a new emerging industry, and there are very few people who are lawyers who are looking to get into it. So, ha, 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 how can I massively, like, duplicate and expand as fast as possible? Obviously, that's an oversimplification. I'm not damning every esports lawyer, far from it. But most lawyers, in my experience, who have been involved in esports are absolute trash and... I think this is like an inherent problem where you've got um, not only all these sort of bad eggs like operating in the scene, trying to you know get as much of the pie as possible, but they're simultaneously trying to set up all these like gatekeeping like faux uh, institutes where it's like, by the way, you're not even allowed to be in my industry. You're not even allowed to have credibility unless you pass my self-made uh, examination to prove that you have any worth whatsoever. Um, so yeah, that's uh, my esports. No, and then right. of course we've got teams trying to represent their, their own players as well, right? You got like TSM set up the the icon uh, agency, which um, like just represents the players in which they already have signed, and then of course like there's a, a, a can of worms that can be opened there. But they say, look, it's two separate uh, legal um, entities. Uh, that are separate, so therefore no fuckery can happen here. But I also hear, and I don't have a specific examples for this at the moment uh, that, I'm, that I'm willing to give, but I hear that some teams are operating as agents for their players, negotiating sponsorship deals and such and so forth um, under the same roof, not, not a separate um, legal entity by any means, and are also just putting that on their P&Ls, their profits and losses and stuff like bolstering their revenues and, and thus their, their valuations and such. 
by doing the shady things behind the scenes, probably based in LA and, and not even registered to like actually be a talent agent by any means. You know, so like it's it's even happening like within the team level, not even getting third party lawyers and agents combined. Uh, you know, getting them involved, it's it's ridiculous. It's riddled uh, top down. It seems. Well, I've got a couple there actually, because again, if you just say these names, it just invokes more and more stories. So another Ryan Morrison one, and what I'll do here is like basically, I have to be careful how I talk about this because in doing so, which is actually what you're going to find out in the story, I would out essentially who the sources are, and which is exactly, by the way, one reason I'm bringing up the story. What people like this rely upon, they know that if they call out me, Richard Lewis, on certain things, there's a there's a point at which the only way you could prove the person is telling a lie is by basically being like it was x who told me and at that point by the way they got you over a barrel because they made you compromise yourself so what you have to do sadly is you have to take the l and hope in the future something else comes out that shows at least in sentiment that you obviously were telling the truth so ryan morrison basically there was a story i won't say the game for this one i'm trying to make it as difficult to look up as you can basically there was a game in which ryan morrison represented a player and also potentially the team that the player was involved with in this sense. And basically there was a concern that this team was going to do something like essentially they weren't going to tell the player the, the terms of how they would potentially shop this player around or what the situation would be. So essentially like they could themselves profit from it or if they couldn't profit from it, maybe they, you couldn't get that player or the player wasn't on the market. Like essentially there's a scenario like that, right? But this was when you were going into a situation where basically everyone was trying to get into a new esports league and there weren't going to be these original teams. So in theory, the every other org sort of was told by the developer, just let the players go or release the contract. You know, what? Well, maybe we'll even pay you a stipend and you let them go and it's just, you know, then the teams can sort of get the players and from there we move forwards. These people were letting the players think, right, well, I'm in the mix again and I can get these teams, but actually they didn't know. Maybe their org was going to say to people, now nah, for that player, maybe you need to pay me X and then you can trial him, then you can talk to him. Ryan Morrison just came out on Reddit in this particular game and just overtly said when I reported this detail, like... That's not happening at all. That's absolute nonsense. I know I know it's not the case. And this is the mental thing. I was told later that he actually represented some of the people who were my sources in this. And he even behind the scenes had taken credit for being the one who quashed exactly that situation that I just said, I've heard this is going on and it's something to be concerned about if you're a player, for example. So there's one. Similarly, there was another story where he represented a pretty big player in a game. And basically, I reported some stuff that ex-teammates had told me, current teammates had told me, people in the organisation had told me about the way that this player sort of was able to exert extraordinary control over his own organisation that he's just a player for. And as a result, you know, potentially could play God with teammates, careers and what was going on. And basically, Ryan Morrison also knew exactly who I was talking about and even used the premise that I hadn't consulted the lawyer of the player, him, mean to mean I couldn't know any of this information because, again, he was using the game of just out who all your sources are, because otherwise they can't be credible, can you? So you, you're noticing a trend that goes on here. Like these people, first of all, they do it. They immediately make themselves like the hero in the story, even though they're actually, that's like basically basic misdirection. They go and don't look what the left hand's doing. Look at what my right hand is doing as I pull this out of my pocket. And then also you can see they love to play dirty because what they know is if the other side won't, you can always sort of get the optics to a point where it looks like, ah, at least there's doubt cast upon that. At least I can't, I can't really know if that's what's going on. Just, on the TSM one because obviously listen I let's just say I have a personal predilection for keeping up on TSM corruption you know <laughs> I always wondered why these people have fucking antagonised me like listen mate I'm obviously a nutter I'll, just, I'll, I'll talk about one player for 10 years in League of Legends you think I'm not going to keep up on your shit so basically TSM loved to claim in League of Legends they did the same thing there, believe it or not, Adam. When I actually had a story where I had literal Discord logs of Lena saying, and on Reddit, etc., saying stuff like, "We talk, I talked to a player in the off-season, was getting them. And I was like, well, you're not allowed to talk to players and do that. And they're like, well, of course I meant I talked to their org. It's like, I didn't control your keyboard, love. You <laughs> fucking hit the buttons. And so if what you're telling me is you wrote the opposite of what you actually meant, that's sort of on you, really. I'd say it's in the public interest to know that because in League of Legends, they tried to do American sporting rules where there's a concept called poaching. Like you are, Essentially, by the way, it always exists in contracts anyway. It's called tampering. The difference is if you make Riot enforce it, they can just enforce it tomorrow with an arbitrary rule, can't they? If it's tampering, you have to go to court and you have to fucking drag people through the court system and go 
to different states and find out what the laws are. Basically, because in League of Legends, they'd sort of been caught with their pants down, at least implying that they'd done it. They just had the main guy of Schalke. Are you ready for this one? He's, he is the brother of Ralph Reichardt. Yes. Who is him. also involved with these? Yeah, this guy. So again, literal nepotism. But okay, let's ignore that for a moment. <laughs> Basically, he just said this is not correct. They came through us to talk to the player. By the way, how would you know? But okay, let's put that by the by. And the optics look terrible, right? Now the reason I bring this up is they only played that card in the game where poaching like explicitly is sort of frowned upon and you get shamed for it, right? I basically heard that in games like Fortnite, CSGO, they basically were going to teams and players and going straight up. You know what? Just fucking leave your contract. They'll never take you to court. And you know what? We'll pay the fees anyway. And here's some extra money if you were to just... Just break it. Come over. By the way, sometimes, you know... 18-year-old kids, people who are very naive in the industry. I mean, basically, I'll give people a spoiler. There's a pretty big North American CSGO team that still exists that would have been TSM and might have been in, I don't know, a big, a big project that ends in oint, if that gives you <laughs> enough of a fucking clue there. So basically, the idea is like, that again, one of the maddest things about these people is the goal to pretend that you're the one who's like clean while you know you're dirty that's one of the weird... It's a weird trend that continues on. I've always thought, by the way, it's just that basic fucking cliche, isn't it? Like, a thief thinks everyone steals. Their logic is, well, everyone was... If I'm a, if I'm a, if I'm doing this, and I obviously think I'm a good guy, well, everyone must be doing this all worse. I mean, the, the thing... What I would say is the thing is, like, in... You know, I'll use League as an example. Like, every single org is, like, tampering in League. Like, without a shadow of doubt, like, every single org yes. is tampering. And to be honest... If you won't you succeed if you don't. Let's yeah, be real. if you don't, you, you're screwed. Yes. And people will say and lie publicly, whatever. And I don't particularly like hold it against them. It's it's whatever. What's most embarrassing about TSN is how do you get caught? It's so easy not to <laughs> yeah. get caught. And like, then yes. blame exactly. the sponsor as well. By the way, oh, just, I mean, yeah, the, well, it, it's just it, it's just so embarrassing and incompetent. And I don't know. And to me, like this, someone will probably try and make this like a, a gender issue or something. But when it comes to someone like Lena, like the, my personal optics of like professionalism or whatever, like people will blur the lines and gray them for esports and say, mm, you don't, you don't need to wear suits. Uh, it's not like that. Okay, whatever. Like fine. But whenever this person makes any kind of public appearance or appears in anything ever, I always felt like she comes across as very childlike, very naive. And to be honest, a little bit unprofessional. And that's, you know, on its own, that's in its own little side vacuum. Like, I can't really extrapolate anything real from that until I see shit like this. And then when people try and, you know, uh, the TSM fans will try and white knight and say, like, oh, she's really great. Oh, everyone makes mistakes, blah, 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 for every little thing that comes up. It's like, enough is enough. And you want to talk about ne nepotism or uh, cronyism or whatever. Lena still being at TSM, to me, is the poster child for that. Absolutely. Make that explicit in case people don't know the connection there. Well, so uh, way back when uh, T uh, Reggie was first uh, like making TSM, I'm not sure about the exact, uh, you know, when they started dating or whatever. Sure. But he was Reggie's significant. She was Reggie's significant other for a very long time. Many I years. Think about, yeah, I think three or four years at least. Um, they split, uh, I guess, amicably, which is why you know the the company didn't get split up or whatever. Yes. She's also a shareholder in TSM, which you know when people say, "Oh, you can't get rid of it," no, you absolutely can fire someone who's a shareholder. Of course. Uh, so the the fact that she is still working as you know as, as such a lofty title in TSM is absolutely ludicrous absolutely absurd and to me yeah as i said that that's the poster child case for nepotism in the scene because well, she is nothing short of an incompetent child yeah. yeah i was gonna say i was literally i'm i'm not close to tsm source wise or anything i like as a rule but i was speaking to someone who's very familiar with their setup and and everything the other day and he was just saying like um and i'm fine saying he by the way no one will ever track him down but um uh, like everyone just works around her massively whenever it comes to getting anything done if if they can find a way to not have to work with her they will do that and i'm like if she's the president and she's still managing to keep that job and they obviously get double lifting when didn't he like bench himself for motivation reasons the season before yes he probably got paid handsomely uh from from tsm with that deal you know like yeah just just uh another uh, uh, i guess notch on her belt of just being yeah I, i'd say like the poster child of, of that bullshit of course, as an org, at least. Yeah, as an org, generally, they're not an org. Because they understand no one will actually, like, ever... Basically, the problem with conflict of interest is it's not something that legally you can do anything about in most no. of these cases. So what you have to do is you actually do need Daddy Riot or Valve to come in and go, will you just fucking follow the rules I've set or make the rules? Like, one of the problems with TSM is, remember, this is the same org that while Bjergsen was the star mid laner, he also owned equity in the company. He is now their coach... 
still owns equity. So mm-hmm. like every single second of his life, he apparently needs to have conflict of interest constantly like, <laughs> like branded across his head. Even though, again, the fan that will go, so what? Think about what the conflict part of the interest means. It means you will arrive at a point where multiple interests you have cannot be satisfied. Like the obvious example I give is similar to the Lena one, but let's make the Lena one if she actually was still with Reginald. The problem there would be, I might not want to fire my business partner because maybe like that's my wife or my girlfriend in this case. So I don't want to fire my girlfriend or wife to lose a job, but maybe my business partner sucks and maybe I need to fire them, right? Someone's interest there cannot be served. You can't do mm-hmm. both at the same time. Exactly that. And and uh, yeah, it's, it's the problem. Like the problem is that these things are possible. Like the inherent risk yes. of any bullshit going on at all is the issue. Wh- whether or not people actually engage in some fucked up shit, it's probably going to happen, but like, it's, it's not guaranteed. It's, it's the fact that these things can happen uh, is the inherent problem. And that's something I, I don't think a lot of people wrap their head around. Like, well, Lena hasn't done this with double yes. They haven't leaked anything. It's like, that's not the fucking issue. The, the issue is like, this is possible. And then thankfully they just so incompetent. They obviously demonstrated how that shit can work. Um, I'm pretty sure I manifested so, but, that from my mind. Like I just wanted I it so much. You have to understand that I create, I just shape, I bent reality to my will. Like I basically, that I turned on that little level four device using telekinesis. I'm pretty sure that was a wet dream situation. <laughs> it was mental, man. Like, I couldn't believe when I woke man. up and saw that. <laughs> and, and I feel like I'd be remiss. I know it's a bit of a change of topic quickly. No, but do like, it. when we when we're speaking about cronyism, right? Like Call of Duty is probably the second largest offender after League of Legends. Like every every example I can think of comes from League of Legends as a rule, right? So I think that's probably the worst, at least in the West. I don't know the state of things in, in the East, but uh, uh, I don't want to say China's going to be absolutely fucked because I'll get shot and taken down and stuff. There'll be a sniper aimed at me in three minutes, but I imagine some bullshit going on there. But like, like the fans have been jokingly, but somewhat not jokingly, calling the Call of Duty League, which obviously 25 mil buy-in at least for, for these teams, like the Friendship League. Like the fans are joking about this shit, and I'm like, how how are we not taking this stuff seriously at all? And I think it's kind of demonstrated in the amount of players that become casters whenever they're too shit to compete anymore. They don't even really retire; they just kind of get phased out because they're just not that. Like they pass their sell by date for like three years, but they were kept around because they're friends with they, these pros that have been around for ten years, and and become analysts and and casters, and and they are. I was fucking dog shit for the most part. There's a couple who end up doing all right. But then you've got people like Ton and Bryce who are left out for people like Study, who's an ex-pro player, who is just like, I would say objectively not good, obviously. My, my objective my objective uh, look on that would be different to other people. So yeah, I, I think Call of Duty is a massive offender of that. It's, it's slowly but surely seemingly like professionalizing now that is um, yeah. somewhat slowly but surely like well, at least with the roster moves right um dallas empire letting go a huke after like five six years um to, to 100 thieves and they're dropping like some of the biggest players who are some of the most popular as well it seems to me like there's a bit of it it's slowly changing but look like they're all invested in the same league like the success of the league is success for all of them so I, they're all in it together i think call, they're all business of, partners call of duty to me is like the biggest frat house culture in like esports yes. like when i i was involved in like the competitive uh scene with teams like uh a while back and back then like most of the roster swap uh, uh roster swaps involved stuff like oh dude that guy was at the party last week and he kissed my girl like i'm not even exaggerating <laughs> these are like actual about things right. that okay. are just ridiculous <laughs> like so few things were actually based around skill or like oh this person's good or whatever yeah. It, people like players were having legitimate conversations about, oh, this guy doesn't stream enough though. Like he's not doing his bit. Like th- <laughs> okay. this was actually the framing device. Usually you expect to hear this from org owners, you know, sure. like, do we want to sign this guy? I mean, his brand's like, eh. but when it comes to players, like the level of like uh, vanity and, and uh, the, the superficial that comes into putting these teams together is like mind blowing. I mean, maybe within the last, uh, however many months or something, uh, something's changed, but to my mind, that's always... But uh, to me, that's indicative of something in general, like when it comes to Lena and Call of Duty and League and everything, is that people really overestimate like how much the scene has matured. Like, yes. really overestimate. Yes. Like, people are like, there's so much money in it now. Like, uh, no, like, absolute nonsense. Yeah, there's more money in it. That's pretty much the only thing that's changed. And maybe the comfort of living, like, per capita has changed somewhat as well because of the money. But when it comes to... Um, like how how things are like systemized and how things go down and r- regulatory bodies and everything else, it nothing has really changed since 2012. Honestly, like it's just as big a shit show as it ever was. Um, and I think you know one of the reasons for that is um, 
again, for people who are like new to the scene or like coming in or whatever, they're always met with this like fraudulent force field, right? And what I mean by that, I'm going to use someone else, one of our other favorite people as an example here, someone like Marty, right? Say someone like Marty. Oh, and he's right. by... He's Liz by the no, chickens from Spice slash Mad Lions, yeah. if people don't know. He's yeah. by no means alone, but he's the most amusing example, in my opinion. This guy was attending like esports panel as like a quote unquote expert in 2016. For anyone who doesn't know, Splice's first ever split in the EU LCS, now the LEC, was... Uh, uh, spring split of 2016 and this guy was voluntarily showing up to panels on like should you invest in esports and blah 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 in 2016 yeah. like and i actually this- think splice is a good investment like you should, you should get <laughs> by the way that's that. essentially if people don't know like when the people who are the crypto guys just tell you that the next hot crypto is the one that they obviously own and don't yes. disclose like well it's ob- they've got an obvious reason to tell you that haven't they you know and you know the best thing about this as well as i said this guy he's one of the worst offenders he was showing up to any invite he could get like tugging on the coattails of his buddies like please get me in taxis blah blah like doing these horrendous uh just knowledge void, uh, nonsense, uh, just absolute garbage talks about esports. He then put out an article about two weeks ago saying, uh, I'm a CEO and I know nothing about esports yes, yes. or whatever. And then basically the the bulk of the article was talking about how no one in esports or like no one who owns esports orgs or runs esports orgs, generally speaking, knows anything about esports or anything about how to run a company. It was essentially the gist was- of it. That was one day after he was basically saying everyone's just having a go at ECI to jump on the bandwagon. Yes, you know? yeah, exactly. <laughs> By the way, so he's like, ECI sounds sounds good, yeah. and no one knows what the fuck they're doing. It's but, like, pick, pick one. But the, imagine how dishonest a person you have to be to simultaneously know that you are a fraud and to be just desperately trying to get your foot in every possible door. So not just, you know, it's not just benefiting you, right? It's not like, oh, if I do this thing that I don't deserve, like, for example, you might be a smart guy who thinks you deserve to get into Harvard and maybe through connections, even though you didn't get any qualifications, you get snuck through the back door into Harvard, right? And then maybe you can even succeed at Harvard. That's not even what he was doing. He wasn't doing it just to prop himself up. He's actually speaking to other people on the industry. He's essentially there to educate these people about the esports scene. And he's doing so knowing that he is a complete fraud and he doesn't know anything about esports. And that is pretty much par for the course, to be honest, with a lot of the, I mean, um, the bottom line is if you ever want to know anything about esports, just do, in my opinion, just do your own research, never go to a panel, never to show up to yes. anything unless you've actually really researched the people behind it and you're generally interested in that individual. Except for this individual podcast episode. Yes, oh, of course. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Like, well, like, it, uh, what we're saying is gospel, by the way. But then also like Splice rebrands to, to Mad Lions and has more success, more partners, more competitive success. Like they've actually dialed in on a good fan base. Like that's... He's claiming all of that. He's claiming everything, by the way. This is what's hilarious, is that the day, basically the day he left, everything upticked for that organization. Now, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but, you know, I mean, I think he may may or may not have have something to do with that. But he is trying to claim every single victory. He is literally living vicariously through that org since he's been gone and doesn't really have any connection to any of the people that were still there. The only semi-decent piece that was ever involved in Splice while he was there, as far as I can, I am concerned, was Peter Dunn, who's not even there yes. anymore. And he's, he's still trying to claim uh, the success. So that's uh, just embarrassing. By the way, just to tag on when we had the early discussion about the poaching concept, because I'm trying to also, if you notice with how I frame my, my explanations, I'm trying to give like the fans those like sunglasses from They Live. I just want them to be able to put these techniques out there and then you're going to see who all the, the cunts are basically, right? So here's the way you know that everyone in League of Legends goes mad for poaching because the best example ever was obviously during the um, off-season before Season 9 was where Fnatic had just won both the splits and then made the final of Worlds in League of Legends. And basically, they did it off the back of having Caps, who was already, like, obviously, like, a prodigy of League of Legends, where any owner would just lock this guy down, like, to the end of time. Like, you give him, like, one of those Zewu five-year contracts if you could, basically. So when they did that, when they were obviously went to sign with him, right... So it's supposedly the case that even though, yes, they were trying to get him assigned during the offseason, it's one of those ones where, you know, like the window to sign opened and it was like, 
and he's gone. Like one of those ones, right? So yeah. basically, they started crying, like, oh, fucking poaching, poaching. And I'll tell you something, right? This is how you know the person who poaches themselves. Because there's a phenomenon we're all going to be familiar with from games. The guy who gets the most mad at cheaters is the guy who himself is cheating, but he's getting shit on in the game. Because he's like, but I'm fucking cheating, so he has to be cheating. That's the joke. It's like why they say that you can always tell someone who's dishonest. Because when they're actually telling the truth, they go so ham telling you, like, look, I'm mad. Now, look, I'm really telling the truth. And it's like, what, what, what are you doing all the other times when you were just slick? You know, like that is, you can basically tell as a result, like, guess what? Do you think Fnatic has never poached anyone? Come on, man. Are they all poach? I mean, Fnatic poached, Fnatic poached caps before caps. Like when I was on uh, running H2K when we were in Challenger se season and it was pretty obvious, especially after they announced the expansion tournament or whatever, that we were going to be in uh, LEC, the next split. Um, and we just had like the best players and probably the crown jewel piece or what most people regarded at that time was Febivan, right? Our mid laner. Yes. And this guy, like back then when, uh, you know, it wasn't just, um, oh, who is the best rookie? Like you watch EU Masters now and you're trying to guess like who's going to perform like yes. best on the next level. Back then, everyone knew about Febivan. Everyone knew this guy was like top three mid laner. Like now, it didn't matter what team he was playing on. And they were just openly like poaching him. Like they were, as in they were like ringing me up and saying, we've already talked to Febivan and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, whoa, okay. But, you know, it, it is what it is. Like, I, it kind of, like, goes with the territory. So I find it really funny when, yeah, they want to cry about, you know, what happened to Caps or whatever. Was Caps poached? Yeah, of course he was fucking poached. But, like, again, in my opinion now, essentially it's just, you know, it's almost part of the game. It's like, how good are you at poaching? Like, it's, it's legitimately part of the game. Whether that's right or wrong, it doesn't really matter. If you put your uh, buy-in to play League of Legends... That is part of what you're buying into. So yes. I don't think anyone should really, you know, unless there's something unbelievably egregious that happens in the pub, like in public, and then Riot does nothing. You, if that happens, then of course, sure, whatever, fight it out. But generally speaking, like, don't don't cry to me about poaching. Everyone does it. <laughs> the analogy I always give is it's like PEDs in sports like MMA. Right, bear in mind that is going to have such an impact. It becomes essentially an arms race of who can do the PEDs but just don't get caught. And the, and the message is, if you get caught, we have to fucking throw the book at you because, you know, we have to make it seem like it doesn't exist. Same with the poaching thing. But as long as you're smart, most of you won't get caught or you won't get caught this time. And so if you don't do it, you're just going to be competitively behind. That's unfortunately the kind of fucked logic and the swamp that we're in in that regard. Right? Did you have another where you want to go on this, Adam? Do you have another anecdote? I've got a bunch, but I want to see where everyone else wants to go. Oh, I, I can I can uh, break down a little bit about, like, the, basically the English general, <laughs> Jens Hilgers, if you want, yeah. who is called Chester King who is the CEO and founder of the British Esports Association. Um, so they Great are example of someone trying to be an name. official body. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yes. And, and that's what I was going to say. It, it combines some of the, the fuckery of Jens Hilger with the fuckery of ES, ECI right. in that they're trying to gatekeep and they're trying to, he's trying to like own every part of what's around, right? So they, they filed for like charity status, couldn't get that. And, and there was a bunch of bullshit there, but basically how it's been set up, I've been looking uh, into this for probably six, seven, eight months now at this point. Um, and, and many people who are very familiar with it, I believe that they're basically trying to be seen as the official body for UK British esports without ever getting that status, right? Because who the fuck's going to actually appoint them to do that? Uh, <laughs> it's just sure. ridiculous. Um, so you like Google how to get into UK esports or UK esports and they come up first and then you, the way they frame things, it suggests that they are the top dog, right? So you have to kind of go through them and that basically, basically gives him first refusal on any company that wants to start operating in the space where he can invest. He's got a company called Esports Global, which he runs with Dave Martin, which is another VC wanker, um, who they, they invest in companies together. So they're involved in Lon uh, London Royal Ravens in the CDL, Resolve in the UKLC who just purchase barrage which i think has been around for a few years like obviously never made it out of the uk really um and then i have a full document of it but he's part of the global esports federation which is 10 cent backed which right. you, says it all there um he was only brought into london royal ravens uh per sources at least um because he could secure the name royal uh, like i think you have to you have to go to like the crown or something mad right or something uh, yeah. along those lines um, and they actually just filed the uh, trademark for uh, London Ravens at first, and then he got brought in. And right. blah, blah, blah. he says he founded it, but it's owned by Rec Global and uh, Rogue and and such. There, right? So, and then, but he's the perfect person to look at for nepotism because he's on the board of like 
I don't know. I'll be hyperbolic, but like 50 different companies as like global board directors. So you look at like Stoke Park, International Group Management. He's on the IOC, uh, the in- International um, Olympic Committee, who are obviously dabbling in esports now as uh, their uh, esports and gaming uh, liaison group member. Um, so, so he's got his hands in, in several different things. And I also heard but haven't confirmed that he's involved in like a, a collegiate university kind of company in the UK as well who are trying to set themselves up as like the national body for university esports. So he's involved with teams and trying to get a first refusal or at least like the first glimpse into any new startup that comes into the UK so he can invest quickly. Uh, almost being like the arbiter of like, no, you can't come in, like you cannot pass um, and he's just getting away with this. No one, I've never seen anyone mention him at all, actually. Uh, and then, like, through all of the teams he works with, like um, Royal Ravens, uh, Resolve, the British Esports Association, all use Raven.gg, which is a, a merchandising company, apparel company. Uh, I can't find that he has only any ownership there on Company's House. I, I, <laughs> I suspect he, he does, though. And when I was actually looking into them, I found that a North American team called Dark Zero had invested in them. So there's a chance they could get sensitive information about their competitors in North America by by Raven working with them, you know? So like everything he's involved with, in my my opinion, is either pure nepotism because his family, uh, he comes from a a, a rather successful family who have their fingers in a lot of pies and he's the son, (laughs) you know? And his son's actually on uh, the board of BEA now as well. Uh, just passing it down in a family, right. keep it keeping things sweet, and and yeah, so and he's also trying to control as many parts of the UK ecosystem as he can. Uh, luckily, like UK esports isn't worth too much, <laughs> yeah, really much going on right now. Cares. But I guess he's he's banking on like if he owns like ninety percent of the small pot, like that's still a sizable amount, you know. So yeah, that's another example. I, I see him as like the UK Yen Silga, basically. I've got one I can knock off pretty quickly here because this is a mad one. If we're doing CDL, how about Overwatch League, right? So when they launched the Overwatch League, in theory, one of the upsides is absolutely when the league completely fails and bottoms out and they shut it down, what they will claim like was the good it did for esports is it brought in all these sports teams and big companies that weren't in esports, right? Well, one example they won't rush to tell you about in that regard was a lot of people might know in the first season of Overwatch League, there was only one team for China, right? It was the infamous Shanghai Dragons who lost every fucking game. And I think they, I think they actually were like 0-42 or something, which is like yes. some sort of yes. mad fucking Douglas Adams joke right in there, but okay. So when they did this, right, what a lot of people didn't know, again, I publicised it, but people don't give a fuck about this sort of thing, was when they were bringing, it's one thing if you bring in the New England Patriots guy and go, why don't you have the team from Boston? Okay, there's something about that makes sense in a way, right? But when they essentially decided to have a team in China, they just let the fucking publisher of Overwatch in China, Netties, have the team. And they control... Essentially, who can play Overwatch in China? Now, if you can't... Now, again, believe it or not, everyone has limits. There's certain things I also don't want to talk about with China, believe it or not. You know, that's for another episode when I made more money than I have now. So basically, all I'll say in that regard is, knowing other things about the way, say, the betting companies work in China, it's actually not the idea, like, you're all thinking there, well, come on, they're not really going to restrict some of them playing or say you have to join a team. Well, you just don't know China then, I'm afraid, mate. Like, you, you just don't know basically what can be done over there that essentially... I would just say you couldn't go to the authorities about or you'd have a hard time doing so because of the connections some of these people have. Like, I always just say, if you don't know how China and Korea run, it's Game of Thrones, basically. Like, their companies just are like the Lannisters and the fucking Starks. Like, And essentially, like, that's just how shit runs. And so you saw in those shows, like, they pretty much do whatever they want, don't they? They run riot. So that's a quick one we can knock off. Another one I thought I'd go into, right? Just thought I'd throw this out there because, listen... It, I know Rich isn't like primarily in the world of journalism. He does the odd piece that sort of is like an op-ed. So maybe he might have some thoughts on this and maybe he can bounce off this a little bit. In the field of journalism, oh, don't worry. We're, we're not people who are somehow extricated from this. In fact, I'd say in certain senses, because I consider a journalist who have a moral and professional responsibility to disclose any relationships they have, I actually think it's outrageous how many journalists basically are balls deep within this or don't disclose yes. like personal relationships. In fact, people might not know this. I have had to, on League of Legends talk shows, repeatedly mention that when I talk about what is, I would say, almost objectively a great feature, that pro view concept that they came out with, where you could watch the POVs, I have to mention I technically own stock in the company that created ProView, because it wasn't Riot that created 
created. It was actually a Swedish company called Snipe. And the reason I mention that is because I'm picking up how brilliant it is. Like, there's an obvious reason where that would be ludicrous if I didn't say it, right? And then went around calling other people on their bullshit. Well, there's a very big esports journalist. And you know what? I looked at what I said before, but if you piss us off, I would have just made some sort of clever comment that morons wouldn't even have gotten about how I'm sure he's howling laughing. It's Jacob Wolf, of course. Now, this individual, all I'll say is this. Since he decided to call me out on what is objectively not a conflict of interest, and he totally misunderstood, I disclosed completely my connection between Flashpoint. Obviously, I could call up my competitor. That's not even a conflict of interest there, really. You could maybe say it is in terms of if you're a journalist, if you hadn't disclosed it. Like, if I'm a journalist and I call out ESL, I don't tell you I work for a competitor. Yeah, I can see that one, but I've disclosed it. I've made it pretty obvious. I'd also even say I've got skin in the game. I don't, I don't know if people noticed, but even while I worked for them, I was calling out Flashpoint. And by the way, the owners didn't like that. There's probably a reason they didn't give me what I wanted for that last fucking contract. So what I'll say is this, right? Well, you know what? If you want to go out there and put out things that you've heard or things, just ideas popping into your head, how about I just mention this? First of all, where's Jacob Wolf in my game, CSGO? It's one of the biggest games in the entire world, right? I'm not going to, like, say I know the number of stories he's made, but I would be shocked if he's done 10 stories in CSGO. And if he's done 10, they weren't the blockbuster ones, mate. Some of them were small ones. I even saw he did one about Flashpoint. I actually know part of the information was incorrect. Then I'll just say this. The reason why that's interesting to me is because the great journalists, I don't even consider myself one in the terms of investigative journalism, because what I do is I do a little bit of what the investigative journalism does, but I essentially just turn around and I use it to inform my op-eds, my opinion pieces. Someone like Richard, obviously, absolutely, then has to nail every detail down. He can't just go, well, this is what I'm thinking or what I've heard. He, If he reports it, there's a reason why he has an insane record. Like, people have very rarely ever, like, shown evidence that he was wrong, which means he doesn't go first on every story. Sometimes stories never come out, believe it or not. There's amazing stories that, you know, couldn't get it over the line the last 5%. One of the stories I've heard, which is in kind of an industry legend at this point in time about Jacob Wolf, is when you look at the massive orgs, particularly in League of Legends, that he always has the fucking story for. He always has the massive player that's joining. Or bizarrely, he knows that, like, you know, in a way that might, like, fuck with the player, that this player's leaving. The, the, the Behind the scenes in the industry, the logic goes, people just say, well, of course, he's in the pocket of X, Y, and Z owner, or he has a relationship with X, Y, and Z owner, so certain stories maybe don't get published, certain stories do get published maybe the way they're framed gets published that way again I'm not actually claiming on that one you'll notice I was very clever with the way I, I phrased that there I'm not claiming that's a fact I'm not claiming it's something I know for a certainty but you know what we're not all just saying things we think about the industry right Jacob it's fun it's fun to do that isn't it so round round two maybe round two maybe nah I don't <laughs> listen that's not even all the nukes in the silo mate so I, mean, I just you know nah. I thought the weird I mean, you got like... oh sorry go on sorry go for it mate okay you no, go for I it. was just gonna say I thought the weird the weird thing about um Jacob Wolf calling you out for a conflict of interest is one of these things where like you know, even though I was pretty sure of, of what I had read, I read it a couple of times to make sure. And to me, it, it, he was kind of describing the absolute polar opposite of what a conflict yes. of interest was. It was like you were literally, if anything, you were literally attacking your direct competitor, which is presumably, in my opinion, that would be like the complete opposite. But I actually have a, a weird story involving Jacob, which isn't actually calling out Jacob specifically himself. I actually think that Jacob was maybe even weirdly some somehow like a victim in this as well. But during I think the I know where we're going, yeah, let's do it. During the period of time when um we like were just before franchising, obviously a lot of people might know H2K were basically the main proponents of franchising, at least publicly, like pushing it just mainly um, on the premise of like the financial model and how... Um, it was unsustainable, was being, right? Yeah, just completely unsustainable and whatever. And obviously, uh, Richard Libby, uh, Lippy, who was the, um, the controlling owner of H2K, was very outspoken, very unfiltered. Uh, like he was just basically in a nice articulate way, just shitting on Raya at any possible moment he could publicly about the areas in which he felt they'd gone wrong. Um, and during this time, um, ESPN reached out to us to speak to Richard Lippy about all of these issues. And this was during the time just prior to Disney getting a controlling interest in ESPN. But this had already been booked like months in advance. So basically, uh, Richard went to New York and sat down with Jacob Wolf, who was at the time working for ESPN, and they did this huge like thing, like you know, fancy cameras, whatever, loads of different recording software, blah blah blah, like multi man crew. This wasn't just Jacob with a fucking webcam, you know, like over Zoom or some shit. Um, and he did this long interview with ESPN, 
and it never saw the light of day. And the story that, and to my understanding, because obviously I spoke to Richard afterwards or whatever, he went ham. He just went ham on Riot. He basically said things he'd never said publicly before about, you know, certain immoral things that he felt that they were doing, like player rights, uh, where he feels Riot's responsibility should be in, like, policing certain aspects. And, of course, like, covered all the financial side or whatever. And the... It just got completely buried. And obviously we went to Jake and we're like, what's going wrong? Like, why are you trying to cover it up? And weirdly, before the interview happened, Susan, someone else who, um, she was the CEO of H2K at the time, also an investor, she said to me, I bet you this, it, like, because she was there in person with him, I believe. She said, this will never see the light of day. Disney will shut this down. Because for anyone who doesn't know, this was just prior to, you know, Disney obviously then investing massively into League of Legends, right? Um, and Jacob, when we confronted him on this, because obviously he was the first point of contact, was like, no, 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 you don't understand. Like, the the the, the uh, files all got corrupted. Like, everything got corrupted. And bearing in mind, there was like a multi-man camera crew there, right? Obviously, different recording devices for audio Contingencies, and video. basically, yeah. Like, yeah people might have seen, there's always another mic you can pick up on. Yeah, like, because yeah, what we said to him is like, okay, even if, let's just hypothesize that magically the video from every camera is dead okay sure what about the audio like, like the audio will do I'm like no it's all lost because it, it all got put in the same like <coughs> it all got put in so, the same cloud folder and that just uh, exploded or whatever like these people had never made like backup copies in their life or something and i genuinely believe that he believes what he was saying so in this case i'm not saying like jacob wolf buried the story right but to me it was very clear that because of the conflict of interest that was arising between like Again, people forget that like Disney now basically owns ESPN and their relationship with Riot and this huge investment and the millions that they pumped into Team Liquid and into the uh, League of Legends space in general. This was just completely buried and never spoken about. Um, so for people as well who generally have this, you know, viewpoint of, you know, I don't want to get into the sort of fake news meme or, or, or whatever, sure. but all the stuff that, you know, does get leaked, think of all the things that don't get leaked or don't ever see the light of day, which are just being perpetually buried by the people in the company. Another type of gatekeeping. Moments. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I actually, the, what would have been the big, probably the biggest story in my career, definitely at that point, it was in 2019, I um, spoke to plenty of people involved with one of the companies that Jens owns and operates. And there was a lot of bullshit going on there. Like um, maybe some misogyny, maybe a bit of sexual harassment, maybe like not taking mental health too seriously and, and a bunch of like just bullshit like that might go on. Right. And um, I, I reached out to a comment, reached out for a comment, didn't get anything like a week later, uh, put it live. This is while I was at Esports Insider. And then, um within 20 minutes he somehow got my phone my, my phone number and was calling me and, and you're taking that down right now blah 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 you've not spoken to me didn't reach out for comment all this kind of shit and then threatened uh, the company i was working for with legal action they got taken down within like an hour maybe two hours max so like like it's, it's so easy for them as well to just uh like basically get keep what information can get out there and can con kind of like control the narrative so as, unless deserto <laughs> want to take want to take that story on and then the inevitable lawsuit that will come from it like it's just a bunch of stuff there that it won't get won't get publicized and, uh, and that's the power they have yeah it's like, the a load of these people it's the concept of being the big stack in poker right it's like you can afford to go all in 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 this case or not go all in but you can afford to bet big uh which in this case would be like calling legal action right when you're the big stack if you're the little mm. stack and you're all inning that hand is going to get dragged out beyond your means. You're going to get put into a separate pot at a certain point where it's like you can't make any money beyond this point because you didn't have it to begin with, right? And that's what these huge companies do. That's what Riot is doing right now with this lawsuit against all these women, the the uh, the, the gender discrimination case. And that, I mean, it, you know, that gets some coverage, but even that doesn't get discussed about enough in, in the style of terms that you I know think the mainstream do. people bizarrely aren't interested in those stories I've always yeah. said this one of the most curious things is massive sports teams very rich millionaires sometimes superstar sports athletes are all invested in these teams and then bizarrely get all these amazing puff pieces about them but somehow those same news web outlets which by the way they claim the reason they lie so much is because they have to churnal it has to be all oh, we have to just do a million stories but bizarrely you turn down the story that would go viral about like sexual harassment, you know, or you know, mass in a culture of a company, or this. Or why is the Overwatch League's numbers so low when all these? You don't ever get that story. That doesn't somehow ever get onto the mainstream websites. Yeah, this is basically people don't know the same principle going on. And this, this is like where I would say. Um, to, you know, the average esports fan or whatever, judge people on when they don't speak up, not when they do speak up, right? It's like, 
Uh, for example, Froskorin is someone who I, again, think is someone who is just like so willing to come out and get the freebies where it's like you can sit back and watch everyone pile in and then you with your platform can pile in on top of that and be like, I stand with these people, right? But it's like, where were you when the uh, this original case with the women was going on two years prior? Not a, not a peep out of you. Yes, you worked for Riot and you were more concerned about you know your career, whatever. Sure, fair enough. But to then come out while you still work for Riot and talk about the Noem thing, no one's going to criticize her for that and no one should on an individual level. Sure. But it's all about what's convenient for you. True bravery is about doing things when they're inconvenient, not when they're super fucking convenient. And there are so many people in the space who are not willing to sort of stand up when, you know, things are actually could be potentially taken away from them, but are more than happy to join the bandwagon when it's like everyone and their granddad's already piled in. So you're, yes. you know, it's strength in numbers. Um, so yeah, that, that's just like an inherent uh, sort of cowardice that I think just exists in the scene in general. And it's also one of the reasons as well, I feel like why, you know, you on occasion, Richard on occasion, these people get so vilified because there are so many cowards who could stand with you if they wanted to, oh, but sure. they don't. And then it's not that the person is looking at that thinking like, oh, people I like aren't standing with them. They're just thinking like, well, this person can't be right because he's the only one saying yes. it, right? Who yes. or anyone who has a platform. It's like, I really like and respect this guy. So uh, if he's not openly, you know, saying something, that must mean that you're wrong. And I think that's where a lot of these narratives are allowed to be pushed. And it's where a lot of these nar narratives are allowed to mutate as well. Because now it's not just, oh, uh, Thorin was wrong about his stance on this. I know that because people didn't agree with him. But now I can make ludicrous reaching claims as well about, I don't know, his political uh, views and stuff like that. Sure. And put it in an article. And because I already know that no one's going to stand with him on this issue, why would they then step up once I've taken it to, I don't know, the alt-right? Like no one's still no one's going to stand up sure. and say anything, right? There's no co corrective uh, reasoning within these people. They're just going to keep their mouth shut, and they're only going to emerge when it's easy. It's just like all of Gay Pride Month and stuff, right? That would be yes. like the social media version of this. Is like, oh, every single orc has done a nice, fancy, multicolored thing. They're clearly with LGBTQ. You're not. You're, you're not going to go to you know actually put yourself out there and actually try and you know, affect this cause. I've not even seen a single org, and I'm not saying that they should, I'm just using it as an example. I've not seen a single org, like, even take to the streets during Gay Pride. That would be an easy one, right? But you can't even be fucked to get, like, a PR jobby by going to a Gay Pride parade and having some pictures taken. Yes. Like, that's on a very basic level. And and you're going to have me believe that you really care about gay rights? Are you mad? Because you changed your social media picture? Like, yeah, the, the level of, of, of cowardice is... Uh, yeah, palpable. I mean, obviously, that's you're right in my wheelhouse there. So one thing I'll say there is also quite interesting if a team like Schalke is in the LEC and the LEC is pushing this angle because, again, the relation to the Gazprom, to the Russian people, it's like, do you actually stand for your cause or not? Because, like, at the end of the day, you either do, in this case, it's when it's convenient and there's zero cost to you. By the way, you are not a fucking political dissident if all the corporations and the government agree with you, by definition. You are not dangerous. Like, you are allowed over the most mainstream corporate media to produce your message. Do you have any idea how gatekeeping works? Like, <laughs> you'd have to live in a utopia for that to be possible. Similarly, another angle that people probably know, but they might not know how it affects actual esports. So, you know, the meme goes, I think it was Bethsaida was the company. They changed every single fucking region's flag on Twitter to have the, the particular rainbow flag, right? But then bizarrely, you know, like some Middle Eastern country didn't have it. Well, there is an esports equivalent of that, which which is Overwatch League, again, essentially, you had no choice. You couldn't opt in or out on this topic. They were going to, on their English language broadcast, make this a major issue because they were making a political stance. Except the problem is, on the Korean broadcast, they admitted all of that. And none of it was mentioned because there's a different tone within that country of what they want on their broadcast. And they essentially chose to opt out of it. Something, by the way, a Westerner couldn't have done anyway. So again, do you really actually stand for that cause? That seems to me, and this is a reason I always bring this up, because a lot of people make this mistake where they think better than nothing though, isn't it? No, because there's a concept that actually I took from American military culture, which is a very, very big thing in America, which is if you ever go around in America and you like buy a, a like a used uh, fucking army shirt or something, and let's say it had like, you know, you were in the Rangers or something, you had some tag on there, right? There are people who've been in those uh, military units who would go fucking mental if they saw you, because their logic would be you're representing as though you were in like an actual like elite military group or something, and you haven't weren't even in the military. It's called stolen valor. Like you're essentially pretending that you are something you are not. 
These people are worse than someone who says nothing on a topic because what they're doing is only when it's convenient, they are cynically using a real thing to get bonies, brownie points on the internet. And then in every matter that really matters, they are silent. They sleep. It's a fucking shack meme, isn't it? So I'll tie this in, right? Because another area where essentially walk virtue signaling ties into cronyism is you know how i said before the people who want to commit the crime make themselves the police the people who want to do dodgy things try to first eliminate the people who call out the dodgy things it all goes hand in hand in the field of journalism there are people where if you go to their twitter feed you'd never know they were an esports journalist there's no fucking videos on there there's no comments about the game there's no articles about the industry they tangentially are in the industry and as much as in their bio it says the website they write for and somehow they get to publish things on websites that are about their fucked up personal political causes but they sort of crowbar it through the lens of esports right and these people are the first to call everyone else in the industry out for cronyism and say there's you're all gatekeeping and you know me and my friends couldn't get into the industry we don't make enough money and this is unfair and basically if you go and look these people are the definition of nepotism because they don't generate hits from their content they don't even really write about esports and so you get ridiculous scenarios like a massive website launches recently with millions and millions of dollars of uh, yes. investment and lots of people making big big salaries and by the way none of like those people will never generate a fraction of what they are being paid for that website it is essentially by the way defrauding the investor except in this yes. case listen buyer beware fucking caveat emptor like i don't really have that much sympathy for someone who does that similarly right the same people work for orgs in exactly this capacity the org wants to flex some sort of social cause so what they do is they create a podcast series and they bring on a bunch of people, by the way, again, just very cynically drafting people in. They're not just bringing in, you know, here's people who are in our org and we can have a discussion about it. I'm hiring you specifically to talk about these issues. When they do that, right... The same orgs, this was recently actually published, he didn't intend to do this tangentially, by Spelzy, who used to be like a guy for websites like OnGamers, and I think with Riot doing a lot of stats stuff. He just published a bunch of stats that showed what the average monthly hits for League of Legends content was on basically the LCS teams. Now, some of the same orgs that have millions in investment and are paying real money to people who produce a super walk podcast that gets a thousand views, therefore, by the way, is just a money sink. Now, listen, if it's a charity initiative, maybe there's an angle that that's fine you take that on the chin the same people aren't then creating great content with that money they aren't actually even me like one of them had like i think they were getting a thousand views a month on their league of legends content this is an org that has tens of million dollars in investment they're paying enormous payrolls like at that point in time yes you can claim i hired this person because i believe in this cause but it looks a lot like nepotism slash cronyism, depending on if they were your friend or if you just, in this case, you worked with them before or or you just want them to talk about one specific issue in that case. I believe you should. I've always said this, right? Bear in mind, I've done a great video on this topic. Companies don't have morals. Companies don't care. Co companies are, they are, I mean, literally in the Western world, they're sort of like demonic, disincarnate entities that actually have rights of a human being and can do all sorts of crazy shit that no one else can. I've always said, if Riot Games was a human being, he'd have been cancelled about fucking 10 years ago, 50 times over. Yeah. But somehow, because it's an entity, we can never... Because the, who is Riot? Oh, it's always shifting who's there and who's in control. So similarly, right? The reason why I always find it really objectionable when these companies do the stolen valor approach is because why does the company have to be the one who tells you they have personal values? Why doesn't every member of that company do it on their personal Twitter? Why don't they say, I support this cause and here's how I do it and I give this to this charity? In that case... Even in terms of leagues, why are leagues promoting causes? Why don't the teams within the league choose to do that or not? Like they, that's why I say again, it might sound like a, a like it's a bit of like an abstract point, this stolen valor angle, but these people are cynically exploiting real things. To me, that's more disgusting. It's the it's the like the voluntary silence on certain things as well. Like for example, I'd have more respect for companies if, let's say, I don't know, a player wanted to tag up as like free Hong Kong in their game. And then, you know, Riot or whoever go to them and it's like, dude, you really need to fucking change your name before you go on stage. Like, this is going to cause a big problem or whatever. And then after the fact, like, nothing nothing happens or nothing said. Like, let's say he goes on stage and he's still got that name. And then it's now a public issue. So then they actually escort him off stage and they change his name or whatever. If that scenario happened, I guarantee you Riot would just be, like, silent about it. Or they would make up some ridiculous nonsense. Like, there was a problem with his monitor and then he logged on on a different account uh, anyway. But I would actually have more respect for these companies if they would actually come out and say something like, you know, 
they're not going to commit suicide. Like, you know, no one's a hero if it ends up with the world imploding, right? That Then it just becomes more about you than, you know, about the end result. But just come out and say something like, um, we uh, just blanketly, we don't want uh, politics to come into our game. Like, you can just come out and say something like that, but they won't even do that. It will just be this really, like, dishonest silence where it's like, someone's taken away and it's all hush hush and basically this person's given a warning but sworn to silence and threatened with you know ndas and all the rest of it and obviously this happened in hearthstone um i don't know uh, it was obviously activision blizzard then obviously huge yes. chinese influence and all the rest of it and all the responses that come out are so transparent and so disingenuous but there's never any actual real backlash whatsoever no, other than never the, a boycott for yeah example. exactly it's, yeah. It, there'll be initial like that's really bad, isn't it? Like, that guy probably deserves to get his prize money. Like, does he? Or do you think so? Because he just changed his name to something. Oh, of course he does. But it's still like, I guess I'll just spend uh, three more packs on on cards or whatever. And again, I don't even blame the the, con the casual consumer who's like, you know, might think like, what can I do? Like, I think it's kind of uh, a sort of privileged position to be like, even the smallest man can affect the scale, like, whatever. Like, I, I, But people with platforms who choose to come out when it's convenient, that's what I'm really against. And I, as I said, with companies in general, I feel like you can actually really discharge a lot of the the sort of tension or the distaste that uh, certain public people or just people in general have towards them if they just come out and give blanket statements like, we are just not political. But then, of course, with the same swords, they're going to start, you know, talking about Gay Pride Month or Black History Month or whatever when it comes of up. Course. So it's yes. never going to change. But uh, yeah, we brought up journalists, and I just want to add quickly: we've got, we've got I'm sure you people. must have some thoughts on this, mate. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, I think you, you've you've both summed it up pretty well. Like my stance, like, I, I think a lot of it's just plainly bullshit. No, I meant um, on the journalist angle. Like, like, like by oh, the way, journalism sure, yeah. is riddled with nepotism and cronyism. And as I say, it's the ones yeah. who are the cronies that fucking do all the crying about how everyone else is crony. Because again, yeah. a thief thinks everyone steals, right? Yeah, and I mean, uh, in the case of uh, so we brought up um, like Upcomer, right? Just launching, and yes. I've heard like how much they're spending per year is it's ridiculous and millions. Just, yes, yes, literally. And um, so, like the people who are accepting like ridiculous amounts of money, even though they know they can't get like generate that return, are just act actively just damaging like the fucking journalism space in which people are just losing jobs because of entities being fucking shitheads. Like the original upcomer um before it was bought by Enthusiast. But I, I just wanted to mention we've got like um so we've got Bloop and we've got um is the name Lara or Lana Lunardi? I think they're both at dot and they're both like representing organizations oh, yeah. as well. True, true. So, That's true. Yes, so Bloop yeah. who is like now seemingly like the leading League of Legends, like Scooper for Roster News and yep. stuff, is like part of G2 Arctic, which is their ERL, ERL team. Right. So realistically, he could either get that information first or choose to not put that out there or block some of the things that he could report on if there's any fuckery over there, you know? And then um, this Lara Ilana, I can't remember her name. It's one of those two, she's Ginger Ed cosplay or whatever. I don't know if she's actually a journalist or just pretends to be. Um, I think she says she actually SK. isn't, by the way. I think she says she's a content creator. Okay. Or something. She, just like Booking, then, you know? she used to be within Venn Global, yes. <laughs> yeah, so, so so she's a SK and Dot, like, interviewing people. I, yes. I don't know. I mean, like, she can get interviews with SK people whenever she wants, right? People from SK or, sure. or the gamers and stuff. I just think there's so much, so much bullshit there, and, and we're allowing that, and no one's actually mentioned anything. Look, I, I can't, like, I can speak out on it. I can't, like, change anything unless they choose to do so. And, they, and Dot obviously don't see... Uh, it's a problem, but for me, if I <clears throat> attach myself to something, <laughs> something like that, like, I would have to be very clear. I mean, I'm pretty sure there are journalists who have participated in crowdfunding for some esports companies and never declared that if they write about them. So we've right. got like Hitmark, who went like, who went live, like the uh, the biggest job jobs platform. We've got we've got like Fnatic, obviously did their stupid crowdfunding thing, and I, I think like even if you've got like the smallest stake. If you're reporting on them, like to me, it's just the most obvious thing in the world to put that shit out there. But uh, the fact that there are people willing to to not do that, I think, says a lot. And I don't know. I think I think we've got a lot of writers who basically just want to be friends. Like they're like Eminem stand, literally. Like they want to be at the lands and they want to be in the press room, and then they're getting selfies with all the players and getting yes. getting um uh, getting their autographs before they're even doing the interviews and stuff. You know, like that's that's what they're automatically going for. So it's like almost famous that movie. Them. Yeah, they're the guy who just wants to be part of the scene, and that's their way in is to be the journalist who interviews. You know, the fucking band in this case. I'm with the band yeah. or whatever, isn't it? But it's just so, it's just another classic case of dumb money in esports. So right, it's like look at Upcomer. Like 
like <clears throat> ESPN, for whatever reason, uh, presumably a financial one, presumably a logistical one, yes. decided that they didn't want to keep these people anymore. Yet, for whatever reason, as a, a new company who wants to pump money in, you rehire the same people. And to your point of like, you know, by accepting these jobs or whatever, they're damaging the scene. Like, absolutely. But uh, uh, course they're not going to turn them down you know and especially you know take someone like Fion who clearly has no self-awareness anyone who names an article boxing with God about Faker like obviously has no self-awareness about their writing ability which is absolute piss poor right like this guy's you know read one Hemingway book and thinks he's a savant so I think it's a, a two-pronged issue of one dumb money these people not actually doing their research you know what what would actually be a lot more uh, or a smarter approach would be you know I don't know do a, a modicum of research and maybe look at graduates who have just come out of I don't know doing literary courses at good universities and have a interest in esports and having a conversation with them rather than the constant rehiring and I guess you could uh, call that an extension of cronyism of yes. oh this guy wrote at the uh, esports branch of ESP so clearly he's competent even though his recent being let go may be an indicator on the contrary not always of course like sometimes you just Certainly, can't yeah. afford to keep people who, on who are legitimately very good but you've, if you've ever read more than one paragraph of his prose you would know that he's absolutely horrendous at writing so I think it's a combination of dumb money and also the people who have kind of have a shoehorn already in the industry um, uh, uh, on that perch and they believe their own delusions and they're of course are going to continue to pick up the paychecks um, when they're offered to them because you know, why wouldn't you? And to be honest, if I represented Fion, I would tell him to take every one of those paychecks because once your little esports bubble has burst, you'll never be hired again for a writing role. And then bearing in mind, Upcomer is owned by the company that owns Luminosity, Seattle Surge, Vancouver Titans, and then a bunch of other gaming websites. Like the, the amount of bullshit that could happen there, literally, we'll probably never know unless they do some TSM yes. Lena bullshit, right? But like the fact I, I, I spoke out about that got a lot of shit behind the scenes, pissed off sea levels at Enthusiast and then had Sean Morrison, the editor-in-chief, like calling me to try and quell all my worries and concerns. And I'm like, look, they still stand there unless you, you unless you like uh, somehow branch off and own this yourself and operate it. I'm not going to believe ever that you were operating in good faith. I can't because like, there's just too many risks there. You know, I, I, I think as, as too much of that shit but look, like me ranting on Twitter isn't going to do anything. Like, sure. uh, <laughs> and these people are all all so close. Like, getting any ins on like uh, information on like these friendship groups is is very tough. And then, like, even if you do get it, you can't say anything because it will very obviously lead back to certain people. So, even if I wanted to try and make some change and call some shit out, the, the most I can do is just say, "Look, this is bollocks." On Twitter, and people just think I'm moaning on Twitter, like in a void. Sure. Like, and I'm just an angry cunt who's just jaded by the industry. But it's like, no, it's like it's literally fucked at most levels, basically all levels. You, you know, you, even even in journalism, where truth is supposed to like reign supreme, right? I think in journalism, at least, as to a certain extent, you can kind of wait for them to fail. Uh, obviously, it's not like a, a great approach. It'd rather just come in and like, have <laughs> yes. someone sure. with actual you know money and brains just change the scene by just hiring and propping up good people. That would be mm -hmm. you know a nice change, wouldn't it? But I mean. <clears throat> It's people like, and this happens in, a lot in coaching. And actually, until very recently, I thought it was never going to happen. But people would come to me all the time and say, how the hell did this guy get rehired? Like, it's absolutely insane. Like, how the hell did this guy get another chance? Bit different with players, right? Because everything happens publicly. You can yes. literally see the fruits of their labor or lack thereof uh, implode on screen if needs be. And eventually, they will just, you know, lose their job. Sometimes unfairly, most of the time, fairly, if given enough opportunities, right? Yes. When it comes to people like coaching, for example, there's so, so much stuff that happens behind the scenes which people aren't aware of, so it's hard to gauge whether or not they're a good coach unless you're an insider. And as I said, there were years and years, honestly, until this year almost, the same people getting recycled and recycled over and over again. And I was starting to think, like, is this literally just going to continue indefinitely? But actually, this year particularly, so many people have been, like, finally flushed out of the scene who are just not going to get jobs again. And I can only hope that that's going to be a similar case in journalism. And you just hope as well that the bigger things get, the more eyeballs that are on it, the more people that are, you know, reading uh Fion's non-proofread nonsense will just be like, you know, at a certain point, enough will be enough. And I also do think that journalism or writing in general is an area where you will at some point get a, a large influx of people because it's it's like, uh, not to this, quite the same extent, but it's like the esports lawyer as well, right? That esports journalism isn't super rife, which is kind of strange because there are a lot of people like graphics designers. I like to design graphics. I like to write. So you would think 
that would mean that the industry was saturated to the same extent as graphics designers, but it's not at all because there are very few publications that will actually pay people to write. And I do think eventually you will see these people get sort of washed away and replaced with decent writers. Um, but I think it, it will it will take time. And, you know, it, there are good writers in the scene who don't get propped up. And a yes. lot of it is to do with... A lot of them. Yeah, people in general don't pay that much for articles. There are some people who play like acceptable rates. Most don't. And people like, I mean, I don't want to speak for individuals really, but I would suspect that people like Kelsey and other good people, I mean, Thorin as well, like would write more if it made sense to write more. But generally speaking, it doesn't really make that much sense. Um, but I do think the combination of writing in general or articles in general not being like a super big moneymaker for the most part and the quality of writing in general being very poor I do think these people will get flushed out. Yeah, I, I, actually, I mean, oh sorry, you go for it. I was just gonna say I, I, don't, I don't think like I think we're pretty doomed in that like that mostly the pieces that make money from from my knowledge are the SEO pieces like uh, the evergreen that are gonna last for ages that any fucking gym can put together. Like <laughs> the ones that are really good, like unless it's like a, a actual like, industry rattling story that's gonna bring the eyeballs. But yes. like day to day, it's it's all the ones that are farming the views on Google that probably don't even make it on Twitter and social media that I just flush through the website as soon as possible. They're the ones that are bringing in the money, and thus like in a weird fucked up way, like the the journalists or like the, the people who are just regurgitating Reddit bullshit or Twitter drama. Um, they're actually probably more valuable. And then someone who's breaking a lot of stories and actually uh, putting opinions out that make sense and like uh, um, putting spotlight on important issues and stuff. I, I, I'd love to be wrong on that, uh, but I, I have a sneaky suspicion like that is the case. Yeah, I've, there's a, I've, obviously there's a whole bunch I could go off there. First of all, I'll say in terms of the site Opcom, it was the one I was referring to earlier, but like whatever. The thing is, right, they've got a couple of people I do actually think are good because I, that's actually, by the way, another method that these sites all use. What they try to do is they try to leverage like... Yeah, we're pieces of shit. We might even have fucked you directly, but you know what? You wouldn't want your be an awful shame if your friend got fired. That's a great. That's a brilliant way in esports, by the way, that people get silenced or people just think, "Well, maybe I'll wait to say something," or maybe, "Oh, I'm going to feel guilty if I'm the one who gets them fired." By the way, I've always said this. I have a very different, like, moral perspective than other people in this sense. In my opinion, every human is responsible for their own action as long as they were not misled into the information that caused them to have that action. So as a result, if you take an action, like I do something, right, and then the reprisal that the other person decides is say they kill my friend. I didn't kill my friend. They had every choice as to what they did in response. And you can never claim as all, like, it's some sort of mechanistic cause and effect of the universe that I killed my friend and that's why I didn't. That other person had all the choice in the world as to what they did. So as a result, right, I don't mind calling up sites like this, even though I know that the people who work for it will be like, what the fuck, dude? Like, that's my site. It's like, well, listen, mate, I didn't make you get into bed with the fucking, the mob, as it were. Like, you chose that. So what I'll say is this. <coughs> if people wonder, it's only just launched, guys. Why are we going fucking nuts on this one? <laughs> all you need to know is this. They've already outed some of the people who were, were the ESPN esports editors who now write for this site. One of the other main editors in esports that now writes for this site is Colin McNeil, who was over at the Score Esports. So this is literally, it's not like in the vein of Score Esports and then you're going on to, it, this is the, the, the bastard child of the fuckheads behind these sites. And I just want to say this now, because this is like a disturbing part of cronyism. One of the reason that these quality writers follow these fucking parasite tick on your ass editor-in-chiefs, who, by the way, have... Now they have the qualifications. They've been in esports five years. But they walked into gigs where, like I alluded to before, someone was a staff writer four levels below me at a site six years ago. Two years later, he's the editor-in-chief telling we're better writers, we're more experienced writers, this is how you will write your article. One of the things they do is they psychologically manipulate the quality writers because a lot of them, can you imagine nerds would be like this? They might be really knowledgeable or skilled in one area, but lack social skills or social awareness. Or maybe they might have some sort of insecurities, anxiety about their work. These motherfuckers tap into that and create a toxic relationship where they edit every article article that person does in the literal sense every time the person writes what might be a brilliant article they have to say it a bit too long on this part though. i'm going to take this last paragraph yeah. out and you know what i'm going to rephrase this first part and these people get into a toxic relationship where they believe oh he's the one making my articles good and all i'll say is this this ain't speculation i've had some of those people where i've said it's weird you didn't mention this angle though they were like oh actually that got trimmed like they said it was a bit too long they'll paste me the part that they've put and sometimes this was the heart of the fucking article that this guy cut out and so the worst thing is some quality people promote these individuals whereas as i'm 
I'm saying in this case. Like, put it this way, the greatest editor in the world, his, what he would brag about is he's invisible. You don't even fucking know what he's doing. If anything, his dream is never to have to take something out of the article. But think about it. Because mm-hmm. these people on some level know they're not legit. It's the only way they can make themselves matter. They have to put their fingers in all the pies in that sense. They have to have their fingerprints on everything that goes on their site. So already that's a problem. Then I'll skip into some other areas of journalism, right? Another one that was a classic is Riot gets involved with conflict of interest. So basically, years ago, it's now, funnily enough, owned by TSM as the Blitz app. But you right, remember, they brought up this website, Blitz, right? And again, by the way, it had some pretty good people, actually. Like the guy, I can't remember the name of the guy, Mark something, who was doing like the interviews, seemed pretty legit. You know, he had a pretty good manner to him. He was doing in-depth interviews with people. What he didn't reveal, of course, that I, of course, came across, was that basically Riot or some Riot people were like the some of the initial investors in this site, which then was doing interviews with people like Monte Cristo, where the premise is they're criticizing Riot or contrasting Riot Games League of Legends with Overwatch by Black Vision Blizzard without ever disclosing this information. And are you ready for the punchline? Because this is going to be, the again, another trend you're all probably going to recognize. When I outed this, right, they didn't, Rich, actually, go the angle of like, well, this is a lie, it's, it's not true. What they did is they, on their main account, publicly thanked me for reminding everyone that there was a thing that they should have mentioned. And they did a Riot Games move, which is Riot Games movies. You just remove timeline. You just go. It's a good job you guys have got mad about this because I intended actually to remove it anyway. And now that you're mad, I'll just remove it immediately, which I was always going to do anyway. And so in a mad way, you don't even give the other person credit for calling you out. And you pretend you always were the good guy. So... Again, our field ain't a great one for that. There's a lot of fuckery there. I also thought, just as a, as just a quick riff on the side, just as an aside for people in the industry, I know there's a lot of nuance to topics like conflict of interest, like, you know, who you're associated with. So eSports Talk is a site that is basically the video version of journalism, except they don't even really do journalism. A lot of it's just reading tweets out and essentially, or just explaining to someone from like COD why this is drama in League of Legends. It's basically, it's like, like to even call it TMZ is not that great because TMZ sometimes does interviews, mate. Sometimes they actually <laughs> might actually, you know, fucking follow a source up or something. They might even have a legit source. These guys just report things that are, you know, you can see with your eyes. Now, Loads of organizations in esports, the biggest ones in the world, t Borgs, send out merch to these guys that they wear in the videos, that they flex on the... T- now, these people are supposed to be reporting on those exact individuals. Now, what's funny here is people might say, Thorin, don't you appear in jerseys in your videos? I don't do it when I'm doing investigative journalism. I don't appear in a fucking Team Liquid jersey when I'm calling out Cloud9 for being shit. I do it, by the way, as a troll. Like, if Cloud9 adds a player and I'm giving my opinion, I'll wear the Team Liquid jersey just to, to make it to fancy. Like, what the fuck? That's so bad. I'm doing it as an actual troll. And then, by the way, if you ever find out I've ever got any connection I haven't disclosed, please go ahead and wreck me publicly. I would ask everyone to do it because, like I've always said, mate, all my sins are out in public. I don't have any skeletons in the closet. Like, oh, listen, the last half an hour, Jacob Wolf's been trying to hype up everyone he can to see if I've got any but there isn't any there the cupboards are empty cupboards are empty mate i what, what i found so funny about esports talk which is like again the guy who like runs it or whatever which people seem to talk about esports talk with like the caveat that like by the way this isn't against jake which i find really weird because it's not like okay i've seen this guy you know murder his girlfriend or something but he does seem like a slimy weaselly individual in terms of all observational evidence and i think almost the peak of that was when the video came out about uh, which was like just the disgusting video that they made on on Richard Lewis. It was when people were complaining about it, even people that were really sort of riled up and upset about it were like caveating it with like, oh, but this isn't against Jake because he's not the one that read out that video. The whole time when I watched that video, I was thinking, this is weird. Who's this guy? And I was thinking, this is the only time I have ever seen Jake not do a video. And my conclusion from that wasn't, Jake must be a really great guy who decided not to personally do this video. My conclusion was, what a little coward. Like, clearly, you are by proxy at least endorsing this. Oh, this I've got an update project. for you after you tell the story. Yeah, go on. This is your p- project. This is your baby. Esports talk is your thing. And it was kind of like the worst sort of double-edged cowardice I'd ever yes. seen in esports where it's like, you want this to go ahead, but you don't want to be directly associated with it. So you palmed it off to this, you know, uh, sort of budget uh, James from uh, CSGO looking ass guy who's just chatting shit about um, 
yeah, about, about about Richard and basically destroying his own career before it got started. Now, don't get me wrong. I have zero sympathy for that rat who uh, took on the piece. Absolutely none whatsoever. But I find Jake almost, uh, if not just as culpable for it. And I find it actually m- him more cowardly for not being the guy that did the story. Oh, here's a good one for you, mate. There's actually an update to that story that a lot of people don't know. I know Richard hasn't yet like ever mentioned it in his concerts. So I don't know if he will. Basically, when Richard made his video where he pointed out, like, like basically, they don't they didn't understand a journalistic concept called like, you know, what is in the public interest? Like, what should the public know? Mm-hmm. So, for example, say someone's like a pro player in League of Legends, and I find out that they have some very weird sexual peccadilloes. It's none of my fucking business to report that. Why why would that be in the public interest and all that? He didn't he doesn't deserve that doesn't come with the territory when he signs up to play League of Legends. So similarly, right, they obviously went way beyond the line when they, in some of the stuff that they were pushing in that story and they claim without knowing right so when that guy who had the boss fucking like this is how you know life can't be real because the script writers are from game of thrones season eight his name is hunter grooms <laughs> <laughs> that, that's real i know it's it's so childish but you know what it'll always make me laugh so when this motherfucker because another thing as i've said they can never take an l they're never wrong when he came out and by the way it didn't do it in a video i noticed but his response to richard was a google document right mm. you have a motherfucking a channel called better than a tweet longer mind but i know but by the way you have a channel called esports talk where all you do is talk about the updates of drama why no video on that one because you'd probably have to mention to your fans you know he called us out and said we used his actual grief over the death of a loved one of his you know you probably don't want to mention that to your fans do you so here's the interesting detail when he made this statement in which he kind of you know danced around and sort of apologized but didn't and then said the parts that you know he still stood by like they love to double down as well you know it's when they claim they're apologizing the jake guy responded to the tweet and said like something along the lines like i'm so proud to work with you on pieces like this so he doesn't he doesn't even have the plausible deniability yeah that you as you were saying it looked like he was creating because i know actually richard himself said oh i don't necessarily have anything against jake because of this like mate these guys can't help themselves the thick as thieves it's metal they have to get in on it here's a good one for you by the way in terms of like People, it's because it reminds me of the whole Blitz Chong thing, where something happens that's outrageous. It's actually outrageous on grounds that have nothing to do with, you know, what people are like trying to imply it's about. And then the company half walk it back, and people use the logic of like, because you just went from like beating your kids to now you just shout in their face, like, well, that's better than, you know, beating them. Like, well, no, it's still fucked up. So what happened was, I bet a lot of people won't know this story because I'm not going to talk about an obvious team and a guy called LS from League of Legends. I'm going to talk about a story from a couple of years before. When LS was first becoming a really big streamer in League of Legends, it was really popping off, right? Obviously, to some degree, he can be fucked with by Twitch Korea, right? Korea, like a different branch of those companies, right? And basically, someone on his stream, I can't remember the context, but basically, I think they did something like, maybe they did like a text-to-speech of some Korean or something, or something was played. And essentially, if people don't know this, in the Korean language, which has a totally different syntax, and like, it's basically very, it's one of the hardest languages to learn if you have English or like romantic language based, like we in Europe are. Basically, the words that can mean in certain contexts, you or me, so you can understand, pretty fundamental to the language. You're not going to change those because someone says, I don't like that. Basically, they sound like a very famous slur that people might say on the internet or in a country like America would be an obvious example, right? Or at least that's the way it would be purported at all times. Now, because it sounds like that, and when they said this word on the stream, LS laughed, even though it was shown... Two people like Twitch, no, objectively, this was another language. They are not secretly trying to say a word that didn't exist at the time that this language was invented and is a fundamental part of saying any basic sentence in a personal relationship. Even though that was the case, like the angle was, it was kind of like that time they banned the certain top lane in League of Legends for saying something he didn't say. They basically went like, right, you're banned and you're getting punished. Oh, we didn't quite do it, so we'll just reduce the ban. Which, again, will never make sense because if you didn't do the crime, why would you have any kind of punishment? But their logic was, we reduced it. And again, by the way, on this particular topic, I think I was the only person who stood up for it. Like, everyone else in League of Legends just said nothing, sat on their hands. Even other people in the streaming world, because the difference is the certain League of Legends top lane I was talking about, TF Blade, he worked for Team Liquid, mate. He had the Team Liquid owner going out there. He had all sorts of people getting his back. So, again, people love to, like, sort of take the cause that has no danger attached to it. They don't ever like to do the one that could actually fuck with your career. Obvious examples, anything tangential to Korea, anything tangential to China, 
anything tangential to Eastern European money, maybe from illegitimate sources. Like These are the stories, bizarrely, these super brave people, they can't really ever seem to have an opinion on these topics. I mean, this is just like an extension of what is like a broader political and social media issue in general, which again, extends to Twitch, of course, as well, which is basically in 2020, 2021, if you are perceived to be on the correct side, then you can make whatever mistakes you want to make. Like as a you know political example, if Black Lives Matters people are doing abhorrent things, then generally that will be you know it, it's not like they'll say oh I support them that they're you know being violent or losing oh, whatever, yeah. but it will just be oh this was a mistake that we have a lot more sympathy for because they're still on the correct side of the aisle, right? Yes, and that is extended in in esports and on Twitch especially to the nth, where it's like Twitch will always be very quick. Uh, and very deliberately will ban anything which is perceived remotely controversial whatsoever, because even if they got it wrong, even if they got the punishment wrong or whatever, it doesn't matter because the overarching thing they will always fall back on is we are on the right side. So we're allowed to make mistakes, which sure. is obviously a ludicrous fallacy because let's say you're on the quote unquote wrong side, but you do something correct. You're never going to be met with the proportionate reaction as you would be if you'd actually done the wrong thing, but you're on the right side, right? It's just this complete paradox which has always existed. Um, and I don't want to make this like, you know, right about uh, right versus left or something like that. Because, oh, of course. You know, whatever. I would actually like consider myself like more left leaning, if anything. But it does seem that anything which is uh, even sort of tenuously attached to the wrong side of the political aisle, even in the context of, of gaming or just being edgy, which is apparently yes. now like just belongs to one side of the aisle and not the other, yes. which is bizarre, will always be disproportionately punished. And they can do that and get away with it repeatedly because they are playing for the correct team. Yes. So you can see which way the wind's blown on that one. Yeah. And th 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 by the way, this is again for a scoring in a nutshell, right? For a scoring, sure. and you know, no one has to co-sign this. In my opinion, she is a disgusting human being. I think she's absolute scum of the earth. But she will never, no matter how many like other individuals would want to say that or agree with that, or whatever. Generally speaking unless, you know, mountains move, she will never be considered that because she is perceived to be playing for the correct team. And she is supporting, even though her arguments are trash and not consistent, and actually, if you break them down, don't even help her own cause, because yes. her arguments are, quote-unquote, for the correct team, she is never anything other than uh, a victim, and she is on the correct side. And if you attack her, you are an oppressor, and she is the oppressed. Yeah, basically, if people don't know... Like one of the what, like if people don't know, I've basically tried like my hardest to fucking find a way mentally to frame it that like because I knew her in the in the past when I thought she was a very upstanding person that she is a very diligent individual blah 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 etc 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 before she got radicalized by politics. Basically, I always tried to find a way to do what you'd like to do, which is like let's separate the person from their work, and then if the work's good, you know, we'll just big that up because obviously that used to be the naive dream of what the esports utopia would be, which would be like everyone leave all the other shit at the door, just do some good work. Work, don't be a fucking arsehole, don't ever do anything wrong. And then, you know, we can all argue in private groups about that, or you can do you can just use your Twitter for that if you really want, you know. But in this particular case, like if people don't know that one of the examples I'm gonna point to was obviously the one where she basically made quite an absurd sort of racial judgment about her former fucking colleagues on a broadcast and then did two things that were mad to me. First of all, you could literally not make this racial judgment about any other race in any other context in the world. And this is not a political statement. That is just a, basically, I would say like, I wouldn't say objective fact. I would just say like the evidence bears it out. Let's just put it that way. Then there's the angle that when she was called out for this, not by many people, I'll again notice, despite how much they're all virtue signaling. The big problem is there was two angles. One, people tangential to her took the angle that because she'd used the term white, they went, well, technically there isn't anything called white. Because actually that's correct. That if you look, it was something that was invented in like the 20th century as a way to make, for example, like Irish people think they depressed people that they had no connection with whatsoever. It was basically like a side angle. So even though in the most trivial sense they're correct in that, what you're saying is I can use this term as a powerful weapon that means a lot to everyone. And then simultaneously, if I get caught, I can just go like Bill Clinton style. Like, well, what is the word is really in the end? So similarly, right? Then the other angle was she did the classic move for people who are from this school of activism, which is like a very aggressive type, which is, again, it's a Morton Bailey. You come out with this super bold statement, which, by the way, you intend to offend 
offend people. Because in fact, part of the mechanism of what you're going to do is when people get offended, you're going to go, look how bad racism is in this. Look at the way these people are misconstruing what I'm saying. And then you're going to then claim... I maybe phrased it the wrong way, but I was trying to start a conversation. Now, again, all I'll say in line with what Rich says is try making a mega edgy comment in a different direction on the compass. It's not just left, right, obviously. And then try saying, well, of course, what I meant behind it was this thing over here, you know. I can tell you myself, that doesn't work. Like, that is not, that is definitely not allowed. They can read your mind and know what you meant. Like, no one else gets to choose their interpretation. So anyway, that's a bit by the by, but definitely, by the way, I think it ties into the cronyism angle because just look at the people who have everything to say about every other topic. And then, as you say earlier on, Rich, it's how conspicuous the silence is. That actually tells you more, by the way, than if they'd have even given like a piecemeal, like, yeah, probably shouldn't do that. Like the fact they say nothing, they essentially, because they go out of their way with every other topic, it's actually what I call for scoring out with a neon thing in the first place. You essentially tacitly uh, did co-sign those other things by the fact that this is what pissed you off the most, not all the other shit. That is a real thing, in my opinion. By the way, one of the things we missed it earlier, I'll very briefly touch on, because it ties into the agent angle. In CSGO, Again, bit of my home turf. We had this outrageous scenario where they set up what is the Counter Strike Professional Players Association. And sadly, mm -hmm. I always have to stress the word association because they can't call themselves a union because a union is a legal term. And in doing so, you know, like, for example, I believe US labor laws would have to apply to certain things with some of the players. When they set up this association. I'm sure Bryce will come out with a union at some point. Probably. Right? Don't, don't you worry. When they did this, right? One of the things that obviously they are supposed to do is represent players in terms of like, you know, the rules and they're supposed to battle against team orgs, potentially if the team org has a different interest to the player against tournament organizers in terms, of, you know, maybe conditions and how is the prize money played out. And for example, will a TO punish a team org that does something wrong with a player? You can see obviously what a tenuous position you're in when you take this advocacy position for players. It was later found out that not only within my own project, Flashpoint, had they effectively fucked players on a bunch of deals. But even worse than that, they then were found and had to admit themselves they had operated as an agent for some of the Astralis players with the Astralis organization simultaneous to being this advocacy group. And in doing so, like, they had openly admitted it. It was wild. And so in that scenario, like, to me, you basically invalidate the premise of the organization. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't, have they done anything of worth so far? I can't remember when they were founded now, but they've probably been around. They've maybe gotten enough. Like, I think once or twice the TO said maybe we'll do less games a day or something, because, you know, like, right. under, under, like, you know, after talking to them about something. So, some things, yeah, but definitely, like, I, I don't think there was any, like, earth shaking things. No, really. and, and did they, like, fuck up, like, a sponsorship with Flashpoint as well or something? Yeah, basically, there was a mon <laughs> monitor sponsorship, and they just sort of, like, never got back in time, and then we're just like, well, that was Sick. an all shit. It's like, well, well, that one, obviously, we could have given that money to the players if it was yeah, part exactly. of the Exactly. That benefit. You know, <laughs> the ecosystem and versus yes. the players, right? And the monitor might be better. In fact, the whole thing was we just wanted them to test the monitors and say we approve this monitor for use. Mm -hmm. And somehow they couldn't do it. So yeah, nah, that's a pretty mad. They probably itself, conflicted with some of the partners. Like uh, some of the partner teams is partners or something like that. By the way, I'll, I'll also allude earlier when I said about disclosing conflict of interest. Because when people disclose it, it is so fucking hilarious. Because my favourite one is HLTV.org. I don't know if you've seen this one, Rich. Oh, the cool. main editor-in-chief of, editing, of uh, HLTV.org is Mira. Oh, he, right? He's a, a banger, this guy. Yeah, yeah, he's a really old school journalist in esports. But he also had some fairly dodgy methods. I did an interview with DK that maybe I'll link in the corner if people want to see it. Essentially, though, right, when I found out that the company that bought HLTV.org, like I think it's called like Betting Collective or something, a betting company, actually also had a tiny stake. I think at the time it was like between 1% and 2% of Astralis, the team, which by the way, I think it has the record for the most number of weeks at number one in the HLTV.org rankings. In this scenario, where even though that ranking is in theory, you know, it's done by a formula and all the rest of it, no one actually knows the formula, by the way. There's, you know, it's no one knows the gremlins that can go on behind the scenes. And I found out that not only did they own a percentage, but this guy was, I think, like, he was maybe on, like, the board of directors of Astralis at the time, or the Astralis group that owns Astralis, right? When I outed this, as I say and alluded to earlier, they put up a disclaimer where if you go to, like, hl.org slash, I don't know, disclaimer or something, it does say on that website, like, yeah, he does own part of it. They, they got their way to go. It's just a tiny part. Like, listen, there's certain things you can't do a tiny amount of. Like, certain crimes are obvious. You can't do a tiny bit of murder, can you? Like, <laughs> yeah, they murdered someone you didn't. Like, these are ones where tiny doesn't really apply there. But anyway, all they did, Rich, was write this statement and then keep repeating every time I brought it up. 
but they don't have any influence over the editorial standards. And I said, you're not really the main person I would trust to tell me that in some ways, you know, like you can repeat that till the cows come home. Like what proof do I have? Mm-hmm. It's uh, a good one. It, <laughs> it's, again, it's just like, it's that they don't seem to understand that it's the fact that this shit can happen. Like the potential for this shit to happen is, is as well as bad. Like whether they do engage in fuckery or not, we probably won't know. But like, yes. Um, yeah, exactly. It's just again like ignorance towards what the actual problem is. I think obviously further problems can come from it, but like of the course. how it, how where it stems from, like it seems to just be lost on people. And and I mean like I think I'll, I'll hold my hands up. I work for Deserto, and I think there was probably a point where they weren't putting disclaimers in about uh, Optic Hex having like a small stake in yes in in the company, and they've he's he's divested and stuff, just like To and Jens, you know. So it's all perfectly fine now. But I think they they probably got called out on it, and then from then on did put the disclaimer in, but still like, it's still not ideal. And it happens even at like the biggest publications. Right. Um, and, and now he's, he's not there. And as far as I'm aware, it's just those guys that run it, like they're the founders and directors, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's rife. And, and the fact that it, uh, these problems can exist at all. And I mean, it's not lost. I mean, the fact that optic is the biggest call of duty team and call of duty is the biggest title on the certain in terms sure. of, especially back. And it's well, so. very famous for clickbait, you know, like people clicking the shit and have a lot there you of go. So, there, so yeah, that was problematic. And it's the same at, at HLTV, which is effectively like a, and a gambling affiliate site, right? Masquerading yes. as a news site, anyway, <laughs> which is, is is definitely something. They even, by the way, fifteen-year-olds viewing the site. Here's a fun know. one for you, because uh, as you say, obviously a lot of kids in, in esports, right? They used to on HLTV.org because they they're so bad, by the way, at monetizing their sites. If people don't know, they have millions of views, but it's not a joke. They come from countries where it's not even worth like you know, any fucking money at all. Like you don't get the money that you get if you get the YouTube demographic of America and you know Australia and the England. They have the ones where like those people, you could get a bazillion of them in a room, mate. Like, it's not going to add up to very much money. So as a result, unsurprisingly, they can't monetize the site very well, no matter what the numbers are, because the numbers are semi-fugazi, right? Because a million hits is not a million hits, depending on where they're from. So one of the problems they had was they used to have a really obnoxious, massive ad that went all around the outside of the website. So if you misclicked slightly, you clicked on this ad, and it was a gambling sponsor. And the tagline of the gambling sponsor, obviously totally unlicensed, was get rich fast. <laughs> And when I point it out, this is mental. Like, you are literally... That is false advertising in the country we come from. Like, me and Rich, like, oh, all of us, actually. Yeah, the United Kingdom, that yeah. would absolutely be false advertising immediately. Right? They said to me but you're sponsored by a company. Now, the sponsor company I was sponsored by had like a UK license. And if you ever watch any of my intros, I went to pains to do this. I never said you will get rich doing this. I never said like, I would say things like it's a game of skill. If you know what you're doing, you could make money doing this. Or if you wanted to bet somewhere, this, I even I put all these conditional things in, not least by the way, because this is why I know people are scum when they don't do that. It doesn't change the message. The fan at home still, if he was going to do it, is going to do it. If he yeah. wants, if he likes the company, like, it costs nothing to put these little details in. But that's why whenever someone doesn't do it, it's a bit like when you know the companies that have the sick artists never mention the name of the artist. Like that wasn't an accident. You're going out of your way to make me think you created that, not an artist. Because what if I hire that artist away from you? So th- there's a lot of fuckery in that sense. Maybe uh, they were trying to get their you know Eastern European demographic rich. Did you ever think of that? <laughs> when they were, you know, trying to click on the thread I heart gay and accidentally misclick and just end up on this uh get rich quick scheme. But I think I think in, in esports in general, there's just like a massive problem with um like self people self-appointing, right? And obviously we talked about it before in terms of like a group setting with you know um uh, the uh, IEC uh, ICE and uh all, all the rest of it. But I also think in terms of like what I believe are very important positions, which you know have a lot of a responsibility attached to them, like for example the esports lawyer, but like also what you suggested before, like agents, right? Like right now in most countries, obviously this does vary between country to country because in certain places you do actually have to declare yourself as an agent, and it is actually regulated. Right. But in, for the most part, in most countries, it's not, and you can represent whoever you want. And you know, I myself even come under this banner, right? Like there is nothing like official or anything which gives me the right beyond anyone else to be an agent or not. I'm essentially just a self-appointed agent. And I can, you know, justify it in my own head by saying like, I spent literally over 10 years negotiating on the other side of the table. So I think I'm in a good position to do so. But ultimately it's my own opinion and my own discretion. And there are a hell of a lot of people who essentially their background is, I used to be an esports player. So obviously I'm qualified or 
I used to do this or I used to do that. And they're just coming into the scene even more bare thin than an esports lawyer, at least to claim to be a lawyer, you presumably pass the bar or something in some country. So you have some kind of claim on the base level. But esports agents are essentially just people who wake up and decide they want to be an esports agent. And they are cropping up everywhere, like left, right and center. And I'll speak to a player and say, you know, it's the off season. And like, is anyone helping you this off season? We're looking for a new team, blah, blah, blah. And they'll say yes. And I'll say, out of interest, would you mind telling me who? And it's just some random guy who was like the team chef for like uh, Eastern European Challenger Org, who's now de decided that getting 200 a month to set up PCs wasn't really worth it. So now they're an agent and that's it. Like, and then they're just, you know, cross-referencing with their buddy who at the same time decided to become an agent and they're like referencing each other and vouching and be like, don't worry. Uh, uh. And again, this is kind of like, ignorance winning over less ignorance right or oh, sorry winning over more ignorance and it's the same with like the player associations in counter-strike it's like this idea that you're meant to be putting in protective measures to help people who are on the whole ignorant in certain areas yes. right so if a player is uh, inordinately good at playing a video game that you know he's most likely not going to be very fiscally bright or understand the economics between teams and etc and he needs outside help but they are falling victim more often than not, to people who just come in with a modicum more knowledge than they have, enough to speak to, and for the player not to immediately understand, which is like the verification tick, like this guy knows what he's talking about, that they just make a partnership and it just becomes this this cesspool of like basically greed and you know all these other things seep in. So we're at a point in time where, again, there's no regulatory board whatsoever. And I do think when it comes to these kind of things, you do have to be very careful about how you regulate things and not all things should be regulated. But I think this is an area where at least you need some kind of oversight, which is why I said... Um, for example, that I was in favor of just, you know, for example, seeing the agent names on a database when it comes to League of Legends or something like that. I would like to see something similar happen in Counter-Strike, where Counter-Strike is still, you know, it's it's a huge esport. It's one of the, well, it's the oldest esport if we're talking about mainstream esports. But because there's not as much centralization in Counter-Strike, it does still have an open circuit model. Yes. There, that there's not as many... Uh, overlapping like communal areas where people have visibility that I actually think putting together some kind of database like that in Counter-Strike would be really valuable oh, because you will immediately see all the conflicts of interest. Forget about the agent competency. Yes. Like this guy's probably representing three other orpers, mate. Like, just seeing that alone is going to enable the the player to make better decisions. But right now, it's just the blind leading the blind. Uh, it's just you know the 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 guy who's who's leading the player happens to know a couple more buzzwords than the player himself, and has managed to you know reference him or get vouched by any of his buddies who have just woken up that Sunday morning and decided that they want to be an agent. But because of as well of all the different countries and everything that you're dealing with, it's very difficult to get like everyone on the same page in that kind of sense. So I think that the best solution for that right now is what's usually the best solution for a lot of issues, which is just education. And I think the quickest way you get that is by someone like compiling some kind of database. Obviously, the problem you'll immediately run into is you can't really mandate it. But even then, that's useful, right? Because if someone's not willing to opt into this like communal effort to educate players, that should be a red flag, right? It's again, it's like, it's not just what you say, it's your silence. If you're not willing to put your name on this thing, which, you know, if we're assuming in an all things are equal situation, it's a very innocent project, which is just designed to help players, that to me would be a red flag. And I would tell a player that if they were asking me, you know, have you heard of this agent? Is he good? Well, is he on the database? Is there a reason why he's not on the database? And I think, as I said, that's like a systemic problem in esports in general, which is a so much like self-appointing without oversight of where these people came from, what they're doing, like who else do they represent? And I think that's where a lot of these conflicts come from. You can talk all day about, you know, as you said earlier, in terms of like teams are also representing on the same deal, the player and et cetera. You, you might have, you know, written a hundred articles and a hundred made a hundred videos on it, but there are many players who don't read or watch anything, of right? Course. So I think just something like this, which would just be standardized and like pasted everywhere would be really beneficial. I had one other one I thought of, which is more by the by, but it's interesting enough, especially if you know League of Legends, the space. So obviously anyone who's followed Richard Lewis's career, let's be real, this video was never going to fucking read it anyway, so there was no, there was no danger of mentioning the name. Like, and, I never, and by the way, I'm absolutely proud to be associated with him, because my friend and a colleague, and one of the best to ever work in the industry, so fuck everyone who thinks otherwise. And I'm re pretty much on the tip of fuck Reddit to death, you know, as a company, of course, not human beings. So here's the thing I would say about Reddit that a lot of people are unaware of. One of the angles 
that Richard very quickly publicised after he'd been banned from Reddit, I believe was the chronology. So as a result, people could just go, you've got an axe to grind. Well, by the way, who the fuck else would run stories to the ends of the earth and that don't get any hits and that basically can't be put on a major content aggregators? You're going to have to have a reason to do it, right? The question is, was what he reported legit? Now, one of the things he always implied was that there was cronyism, some sort of connection between Riot Games and the League of Legends sub moderators because just the way they behaved they clearly like put it this way one of the things he did point out was essentially they sort of did what like i believe um both politicians and uh medical professionals sometimes do in america which is they'll find a loophole where you can't receive money directly but maybe that person could give you a gift and then there's rules on the gift so the gift might be in terms of certain terms of certain pharmaceutical companies the gift might just be like you know a fucking thousand dollar bottle of champagne or it might be like the finest you know caviar from fucking somewhere in Russia that your wife might like, right? And in that scenario, that's not considered a bribe, believe it or not, because it's not literal money, which obviously is the god of America, mammon, right? So in that scenario, somehow that's fine. Well, when Richard used to say this, at the time, because it was only very tenuous links like this, I even thought, how much of this is he reading into it? Like, is he, is, like, has he, he hasn't really got the smoking gun to totally prove that this is like, they actually control these moderators, right? Well, essentially... One of the areas you can tell what people are doing in esports is you sort of look for the footprints in the snow. Like, where do they go? What is the effect of what happens? Even if you don't see what the what the wind was blowing in that direction, you know that things got blown around, right? Something changed things. Essentially, right? Behind the scenes, riot people, head riot people would always claim, not only do we not have anything to do with it, but they'd even actually sometimes turn to people like me and Richard and go, in fact, we don't even agree with them sometimes. Sometimes, you know, they let things up that attack ours and, you know, we don't like the way that goes. And, you know, haha, we almost wish we had control over them, right? Based on what Richard said, when they came out with the game Valorant, if anyone knows how Reddit works, it's a rush to be the first to register the sub, right? It's actually the reason why sometimes you get subs that have stupid ass names that don't make sense, right? When the sub was basically done, he says... Riot went out of their way to give the Valorant sub to the very same group of moderators, by the way, one of whom famously in a Reddit comment said, within the domain of a sub on Reddit, the head moderator, this was him, is effectively, his words, a god who can do anything he wants. Now, Reasonable. You, might, you might know the name of this person, Richard. You could, so if you guessed your top five, you know, Reddit mod subs, he'd be in there. So yeah, basically, if they didn't, have some sort of relationship with them. It's like I often say on Twitter, why would they need one at that point? What would change? What else would they get out of it in that scenario? So that's by definition cronyism. Like you've got out your way to put the people that you want in charge of something that then is going to be presented as a totally neutral, you know, like we have nothing to do with that. We're just here to promote contents and hits. And why would we have? It's like, it beggars belief, like the the connections that exist. And again, sadly, one thing I'll bring it back to, because that's kind of like my final point. That's all the ones I had written down. What I would say is this, I just want to do this sort of content because, I mean, for a start of just telling the truth, if it always feels great to do. Yes. It has its own sort of cleansing fucking charm to it, doesn't it? Try it sometimes, some of you people in the industry. <laughs> and then secondly, since I know I can't stop this stuff, the one effect I can have is to expose it. And then there are some people who do have a little bit of a conscience in the back of that head somewhere behind all the money that might feel a little itch. And you know what? If they even do one or two less scummy things mentioned in this video, it's starting to make some inroads in the industry. So one thing I'll say in that regard is I don't think I'm actually going to stop these people doing those things. But if no one ever calls it out at all, we're never going to get anywhere close to it. Because at the moment, sadly, most people aren't even aware of these things. I, I'm pretty, I bet this was a massive eye-opener to anyone from almost any angle of the industry. Because even if you knew the team orgs were corrupt, you didn't know journalism. Even if you knew journalism, maybe you didn't know the investment angle. If you knew the investment angle, maybe you didn't know connections to fucking literal states of other countries in the world. Like, the, the tentacles go all across. And also, I'll also say, by the way, massive props to both of you for coming on this particular episode. Because it certainly does not, unlike some of those sort of, like, uh, I would say priceless, but in the sense that they just don't cost anything. Some of those like free initiatives that you can take part in where you just get to flex, well, I'm cool and I'm a really nice guy, but you don't have any cost that comes associated with it. This absolutely potentially could have costs just in terms of how people view us. I'll even add, by the way, one of the reasons I was really worried about that angle, which a lot of people thought this is a bit off the wall. Why would you think that they would ever use the gatekeeper angle of the ECI to stop people politically? Because that's one of the reasons if you saw my video about leaving the esports awards, I couldn't be involved anymore. Some people on those panels explicitly said, oh, if I ever heard anyone was involved in any sort of impropriety, now again, I'm not an idiot, so I go be more specific. 
I'll give you an obvious example. Let's say they were involved with some sort of a famous movement online where you call out people you believe have done sexual indiscretions, right? But it never goes to a court of law. You never, ever actually get to basically speak for yourself in a true sense as a court of public opinion, and it will never be proven whether any of those things happened, right? They said, I would never let that person win an award on my watch. So what they were essentially saying was they've invented a mechanism where if you just don't want anyone to win an award, a false accusation will get that done. That's esports at the moment, guys. Yes. Any yeah, final I, remarks for you guys? Uh, I, I would say, like, I, I've been try, I've been grappling with the idea that you said, where you know, like, you, you, like, you can't change this shit, and you can't like fix the industry in a sense. Like, it's up to the people who are engaging in this shit, yes, to, to do it. And I, I agree with that, and it's really fucking annoying. But like, I've just decided like to just double down on everything I've done. I, I think I went quiet for a few months where I was just kind of like, is there any point to this? Because I can't do anything. But now nah, I'm just like inspired by guys like you and, and Richard who like just call out shit even if you don't make you popular like I'm not in this shit to be popular like a lot of the other writers and journalists like so that's why when, when I got invited on this I was like yeah 100% and I've willingly came with names you know like uh, of people who uh, and, and even the story about Jens where the, the piece got cancelled and, and taken down and shit like I'm more than willing to do that and, and in fact like the people who watch this who don't like that we're on about this like I will continue to be a pain in your ass yeah contact Adam can. if you want if you've got so, any tips or leads there's someone you can contact I, I'm I'm 100% uh, willing to go on a ledge wherever I can uh, as long as I can prove that shit is as yes. it is and uh, I, I push it to Serto to, to make sure I can get every story out that I can so I mean um, I I, I well, I want to be a force for good as much as I can be, at least like an outlet for um, some of the, the shit that's going on, like put, putting a voice to it. At least, obviously, there are other people doing it, but another voice doesn't hurt. In fact, I hope more people do. Uh, and I am trying to just pass on little bits I've learned over the uh, like three years I've been in esports now, um, how I think things work and um, how I think people can be better to try and get more people to be vocal and, and not, not fight against this bullshit because you can't fight against it, but at least like put a spotlight on it, you know? So I just want to thank you for the opportunity to come on and, and chat about this bullshit anyway, to be yeah, fair. Sound. I mean, Any you final know, remarks, Rich? Yeah, I mean, from my side, like, obviously I was involved, uh, you know, I, I mean, by definition, I had like an official relationship with Riot for a long time, right? And even during that time, I basically spoke whenever I could and when, uh, like, uh, when the uh, American investors came in, obviously I was significantly more muzzled. And I don't resent them for that at all because I think they kind of tried to, like, organize it more. And, like, they agreed with me, right? And it wasn't – like, th these guys didn't hide at all. And I always really respected that about them, especially, like, Susan and Dick Lippy. Like, they always came forward and put out their opinions, not as, like, vitriolically as me, which is probably smart, right, on their on their sure. behalf. But at the same day, like, when HUK um, sort of stopped uh, operating League of Legends um, – it was like bittersweet, but for a very small amount of time for me, honestly, like initially it was like, oh, bittersweet. But then I realized like in terms of me and maybe this is like a selfish perspective, but like basically finally I, I'm like unmuzzled and I can speak and I can sure. say whatever I want. And I basically thought and theory crafted a way I could put myself in a position where I was still operating in esports, uh, particularly in the area where I still felt I probably had the most amount of knowledge, but where I had no official relationship with riot and no reliance on riot whatsoever because to me the most important thing was being able to basically say whatever i wanted whenever i wanted to say it and i understand that for some people like it's easy to be on the outside and just say like hey you know there's something going wrong in your organization just out everyone like immediately or whatever like life is more complicated than that and sometimes there are more hurdles to that um but just to like finish up on one small anecdote that you actually reminded me of uh thorin just then which is uh actually pretty funny and again this didn't get nearly enough publicity and what i really hate about this story is what when it came out all the little weasels and minions that were associated with this guy immediately disassociated themselves but then as soon as they realized the reaction wasn't particularly particularly big they went back to him straight away and this is ryan morrison getting me too by three separate women who all independently came out with stories that were remarkably similar to one another with very similar behavioral patterns and all the rest of it. And I'm not going to say like 100% that he's guilty of what he was accused sure. of. You can make up your own mind. But um, And what was really hilarious, and I guess this is like, again, kind of the definition of cronyism and conflict of interest in esports, is that the only downside from this happening was that there was a quote-unquote internal investigation in his own firm, yes, his phone that yes. he founded, 
And, oh, would you believe that they, uh, once the investigation was over, they didn't find anything substantive which uh, should mean that any action needed to be taken whatsoever. And it was just pushed under the rug, like, completely. And all the little weasels, like Marty, for example, the milli this guy is just, like, the slimiest of the slimy. The millisecond he got me too Marty came out and he's like, oh, we're not even really that close. Oh, we're not even, I, I don't endorse anything this guy's done. Oh, it was just, I've met him a few <laughs> of my oh, uh, like, And what's hilarious is I was actually just screenshotting tweets, which were just the most pathetic, like you never had any friends in high school and now you're trying to make up for it tweets where he was literally like begging. I'm not even exaggerating, by the way, just like direct messaging uh, Ryan, like begging him to get an invite for esports parties and stuff like just, just absolute tragic behavior. And then the millisecond the investigation was over and this guy was quote unquote found like, you know, nothing untoward. Marcy went running back and it was, oh, hey, uh, do you remember me, Ryan? Uh, <laughs> make sure if you're going to another esports party that my name gets mentioned. Like just absolutely tragic. Um, but yeah, as I said, uh, I mean, I agree that, you know, right now, there's not going to be like a magic moment where, you know, podcast changes the landscape of esports or anything like that. And to me, honestly, this might sound a bit weird and maybe like even like a bit twisted. But to me, I get an enormous amount of ple pleasure just by influencing people's opinions into thinking someone who is a bad person is a bad person. That genuinely makes me happy inside. I don't oh, even man, care. If there's they... a line that we have actually in on the By the Numbers podcast, which is we always say it, it's objectively true. We could produce any amount of evidence that Astralis has done slimy things, right? And someone who's a fan of Astralis, it's logical. They're not a fan because they're the coolest people and most moral. They're a fan because they're brilliant at Counter-Strike. So yeah. that fan will be a supporter no matter what. And he will use cognitive dissonance to find a way to still support them. But what we always say is the one thing you can do, and you can take great satisfaction is, you can make sure that the reputation of the cunts behind that team is outed and enough people know there's at least something going on with this guy that's a, that's that in itself is satisfaction right yeah and it's also like people always come back and even in their own kind of defense of the person say oh but this person's really good at this as if that's like an excuse for anything or to say you know as you said before but does it really matter because of x and it's like for example on this podcast i went really hard at frost scoring right but in my eyes this is my personal opinion i still think she's one of the best on camera analysts sure. that, that there is yeah. like at least in the west and i felt the loss, you know, on behalf of the LEC or the LEC's fans Agreed. when she decided not to be there. I can think that and still sim simultaneously believe that she's scum of the earth. Like, those things are allowed to coexist. So this idea that, you know, everyone gets pigeonholed and blinked and like, oh, you're just always negative about this or that. That's like a line I get all the time. It's like, yes. why are you never positive about anything? Like, they didn't read the first half of what I said. They literally of just course. centered on the negative and then have just perpetuated that and just blankly applied it to everything else I've ever said. And By the yeah. way, I don't know if you've heard this one. This is a fucking banger as well. Richard had a line where he everyone said the same thing to him. Why are you always just reporting on negative stuff? Think about who he fucking is, by the way, and what role he essentially plays. He's basically like the fucking Night's Watch, if you haven't like, followed the story, right? Where he had a line that was banging. He said, listen, if all you do all day around is go around stomping on pieces of shit, yeah, your shoes are going to stink like shit. Because, you know, they tried to use that angle. Like, <laughs> if it smells like shit everywhere you go, you maybe are the one with like... So he actually had like a fucking angle for that. I've got one last thing to say, actually, I've realised. Because I thought of one angle, actually, that does work to help the industry. And I forgot to say this because it's something I came up with for people who are talent who work CSGO events, which is because I've worked CSGO events. I know there's this weird phenomenon where because someone hires you to the event and you're at the event, first of all, in a mad sense, not just because they're paying you, you do feel like we have a connection in some sense. Like they hired me because they appreciate me. Like there's all these reasons your ego can be stimulated to think, I, I want to find a reason they're not that bad, right? And then on top of that, when you're at the event, even though you are literally a hired mercenary, you have no stake in this company. Because you're at the event, you want to see it succeed because by definition, that's how your work will succeed, right? So what people do, and I've felt like the bristles in this myself, but I tend to be able to avoid it, is when someone who's not at the event criticizes the event, and by the way, they obviously have their own ulterior motive, often they weren't hired to the event so they go right well fuck this anything wrong with this i'm gonna be all over this with fucking hammer and tongs right when they do that you start to bristle and because you know part of the reason why is maybe they're just being cynical right you think well i'll defend the organization it's like no no i get i told everyone who works the events it goes like this the person who works the event, if you don't want to, like Rich gave the example there, 
because of the company you work for, you don't want out everything, right? You want to get your points out on some things or you maybe, maybe you mask what you're saying and allude to it. The trick is this. If you work for an ESL event and I don't, I'll call out all the shit from ESL. In fact, if you don't like something they're doing, don't call them out. Hit me up. Tell me what they're doing. I'll do it, right? Then when I work, I'll make, give an example in the past. Say I was working at Blast and I didn't want out them. I mean, it's not really my style, but it's kind of my brand in a fucked up way. But, you know, let's say I was someone else. I was someone like fucking Anders or someone, you know. Cool. If I want to sell some dodgy stuff they've done, I'll hit you up, guy who only does the ESL events. You go and call them out. It'll even, by the way, the fucked up way we incentivize for you to do that. Like, if we all do this, by the way, listen, in the most minor sense, we are sort of pieces of shit that we're not saying it ourselves. But it is still better that ultimately everyone is held accountable in the industry yes. by giving the info. Because the ultimate secret I've described there, that everyone in this industry must know this term, is a back channel. If you use the back channel properly, that is one of the best forces for good ever if people don't know that's actually effectively what the initial concept behind the me too approach was it was the idea that if you couldn't actually get someone who essentially was never filmed like had a lot of power and influence and would never be sort of fired for sexual indiscretion at least you yourself could reach out to other people who might be vulnerable and tell them watch out for this guy he's a scumbag he did x and y to me now that premise again works the problem, obviously, then obviously becomes if it comes something else, which we can debate that it's, it's, it's sort of a side tangent. But basically, I would encourage anyone, like people like Adam, people like Richard, a lot of them journalists, by the way, have open DMs. By the way, fucking God bless you that you can do that. I'll never open my DMs for one second in this fucking world. But okay, you guys sometimes do it. These guys are open to be contacted. And if it's legit stories, they will follow it up. I'm yes. telling you right now. Um, I, I, In fact, I, I somewhat get a kick out of like people, well, I, I do get a kick out. I think uh, Rich mentioned it earlier. Like when you know someone's a piece of shit, and then you can like put it out there and say, "Look, this is the reason they're a piece of shit." Like that's fine by me. I don't, I don't do it for like self gratification, realistically. But like, it's nice. It's nice. It's nice to be able to go like. To bonus. Happening. Like there you go. So yeah, I, I'm more than willing to do it. Look, I, I'm willing to go up against like Jens Hilger, who's got his finger in every pie. My middle name is probably fucking Jens Hilger at this point. It probably owns me, and I don't realize it. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm fine doing it as much as I can, you know. So yeah, I do encourage people to, to reach out, but um, go you know, a bit light on the on the DMs if possible, because yeah, they are open, and I don't have anywhere near as many followers as you, thankfully. But still, it's, it's quite spam heavy. To be honest with you, I should probably change that. I want Richard to open his DMs just for like an hour, just to announce on Twitter for an hour that his DMs will be open and uh, get the the best of hits in the. Procedure. I believe he actually does. By the way, I think he's even said this on show. Oh, I believe really? he has his, his DMs open because really? his logic is. Okay. I mean, he uses the logic because he is an investigative journalist. Like, like it's a bit I like I don't all know all the you, tips you can get. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if you know this, but like it's a famous thing. For example, that like investigative journalists and like mainstream journalism would use a tool called like Signal, which was like yes. similar. You could sort of like anonymously like contact them or whatever and give them tip offs. And the idea was, you know, you'd be using it for like criminal stuff and stuff to like really that needed to like whistle blowing. And so basically, his logic is like that. Even though yes, you will get a million morons, you have to. To open those floodgates because that is how the guy who essentially has no way of contacting you can get to you. Now, mm -hmm. that's also one of the reasons, by the way, why I don't call myself an investigative journalist. Like, I don't want to be fucking exposed to that. I'll just pick my battles. Thank you. This video was kindly supported by Eddie, Chris with a K, Lager15, Pronogo, Shenlong, Zachary Carter, Adam Ox, Alexander Rao, Andreas Crockneys, Animosity, Dean Tanglis, Eric Hillestad, Hades, J Dobbs, Jensen Gore, Joseph Ginsburg, Kovacevic, Tobias Bernasconi, Zumba, Xyrathenia, and as always, special thanks going out to my boy Jerky's Minion. Want to suggest topics or guests for my shows? Want to ask me questions in my monthly AMA? Do you want teasers? Who are the upcoming guests? Maybe you want to be part of one of those discussions I do where we nerd out. Well, if so, put your money where your mouth is and join the Scaluminati today by using the Patreon link in the description box below.